morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 361, 461 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Today, recording day is Tuesday, September 3rd. 3rd 2024 and kids and cubs it's back to the beaver lodge day and it's also back to school day so if you've taken taken some time away over the course of the summer and you know to do summer things and get a summer look and have some summer vibes and now you're coming back to us welcome back pull up a log make yourself comfortable stay a while we're glad to have you Ah, I'm your host, the eager beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Had a little bit of a mind stutter there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day here at the Beaver Lodge. But before we do anything else, Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Um... Hmm. This is a good question. You know, I, I have to think about that to give you an honest answer. I'm a little, I'm a little all over the map today. Uh, I am in full business mode today though, because it is, you know, back to school day. Mm-hmm. Summer is not officially over. It's far from it, but it, it, you know, psychologically we feel like summer's over. So it's like time to get down to brass tacks and make, 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 make the magic happen. So I will be uh, sending out some emails to some people today and submitting some auditions today, along with a few other things to try and get this whole voiceover podcast thing into a realm where I can earn enough money to keep feeding myself and continue to keep a roof over my head. So yeah, I mean, I'm in full business mode today. That much I can tell you. As for f- how my mental health is, honestly, I'm at the jury's still fully out on that one. Didn't have the best night of sleep and... Just, you know, I discussed yesterday what I'm currently going through and I, I wanted to do an ASMR show last night, but I had a terrible indigestion for hours yesterday. It just was brutal. And it's like when your gut, you know, when your gut hurts, everything else just, nope. Right. Well, we were and talking about that the other day because I had yeah. had an upset stomach and you were reminding us that we have like more nerve endings in the gut than anywhere else. So your gut right. health does affect your mental health. It does. It fully does. So I was not in a good place last night. I'm going to do some ASMR stuff later today, though, because I need to um, get the channel operational. Well, it's operational, but I need to get it back to, uh, uh, you know, a regular pace. I've taken most of the summer off from it, and Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's just time to get down, start working hard again, and generating some income. Yeah. So that's kind of where my brain space is right now. The mental health, it's, you know, it's all over the map, but my, my thought process today is, is, is work hard and forge ahead and, and 
create a create a environment where I can earn enough money to you know not have to go to the food bank. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. what it really boils down to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you, uh, doing really well. Good, I have to say, doing really well. Um, things are a little lighter here, of course, since uh, everything with uh, the contractor is done. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we um, agreed to split the difference. Um, and uh, hopefully never hear from each other ever again. Amicable um, of ways, then? Huh? An amicable parting of ways? Uh, as amicable as it can be. Uh, right. We were left with a very, very bad taste in our mouth. Mm-hmm. We were left with a very bad taste in our mouth. Uh, particularly since uh, we were trying to uh, resolve it amicably, but uh, the uh, last text message in exchange uh, exchanged between us uh, from his part did not seem to be too amicable. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so he was still trying to uh, apportion blame, and we were still like, uh, no. Right. It's like documenting what we asked for, writing up the scope of work, and writing up a proper invoice that actually includes everything that you did do and doesn't include anything you did not do is 100% under your control. This was not a lack of communication. This was sloppiness on your part. A lack of attention to detail. No. It's like, we are not responsible for any of this. (laughs) Your problem with us is that we were too present. So with the amount of words that we use, we certainly could not have been misunderstood. So, um, yeah, uh, so it didn't, uh, it didn't, uh, it didn't end as friendly as, uh, we had, uh, hoped. Let's put it that way. Um, I'm not sure he's aware of it because we just decided, you know what, it's like, this is, are we going to fight for an, uh, for an extra $500 here or are we going to buy ourselves some peace? So we decided mm. Of some peace because um, we both have some beautiful opportunities coming up. I mean, Alex is teaching science for the first time, has an opportunity to maybe have his get position in his own science lab. You know, his article is, is I think it's fully published now, or okay. waiting on one last revision, one or the other, but some people are already citing it, so it's already up in some version. Uh, but if I know it's actually finally, finally punished, I will provide a link for people who would want to read it. Um, you know, the, there's lots of stuff like this. He might be teaching actually science at Queens uh, come the winter mm-hmm. as well because somebody's going on maternity leave. He had his contract in the lab extended. I mean, he's just, he has good things going on. It's happening. Yeah, right. It's all happening. And for me, you know, this, this show's doing really well. Our, our subscriptions on YouTube just uh, crossed 11,000, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, um, we both have a lot to look forward to in endeavors. I've got a new curling season coming up. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I don't, I, wh- why carry that forward? Mm-hmm. One of the beautiful things about back to school is that it's, a, it's almost like New Year's Day. Yeah, wipe the slate clean and start anew. Let's start over again, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. I, I typically don't have New Year's resolutions, but I have lots of Neither school do I. resolutions. And, uh, that's why I. I couldn't resist this year. I had to do a little bit of back to school shopping. Got myself a little notebook, a tasty, tasty, tasty notebook well, with donuts on top of it. And you do have a new computer. And I do have a new computer, yes, which I still have not set up. You really got to set that thing up. I, 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 I know, I know, I know. But we're, we're still doing some work around the house. We found out that we have some uh, moisture in the crawl space, mm-hmm. and we're actually digging all around the house to put some insulation on the outside, and we have some help uh, from uh, one of our neighbors until September 23rd. So we're doing that um, at the moment. <sighs> yes. So, uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's an opportunity to, uh, you know, new resolutions. You know, if you're kid, I mean, I loved back to school when I was a kid because I was one of those kids who actually loved school uh, and loved being there. And, you know, and as I got older, you know, as I shared it uh, uh, with uh, Laura Babcock, uh, high school years were, were were not pleasant at home, um, so I was always very very eager for back to school because mm. it gave me some place to be ten hours a day. Right. <laughs> that wasn't home, um, so but I loved um, the back to school shopping, the new clothes, the new trapper keeper, the you know yeah I, I, yeah new lunch always box, the new outfit you know, for first day of school right? yes I mean and, and that sure new haircut. Was great. 
how are you going to look, how are you going to impress your friends? And I think yeah. today it's a little bit different though, because oh, yes. it's, it's not like showing up on the first day and, and people get impressed because they've already followed you sh on your socials. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it's not a surprise. Everybody already knows what you're going to look like because you've already probably Instagrammed the hell out of your first day of school outfit. And then of course your parents will take the first day of school photo which they put on their facebook and their socials and, and and then there'll be a video of you shopping for your clothes yeah so it's not the same as it was when no, i was in school. exactly back then it was a big reveal oh yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. again i was destined to be fabulous mm. first tuesday in september work the runway sweetie <laughs> never, never did that, i've always been a bit of a fashion maven fashion so. baby yes you are you have lots of style my friend Oh, thank you. But it is clear you have gay friends. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to, there's a... <clears throat> Uncles, too. You know. Yes, yes. There's a, there was a picture of, um, I hate, it's almost always her, but um, Sarah Sanders. <laughs> the other day Sarah that Huckabee was... Sarah Sanders? Yeah, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. The other day that was an address that everybody turned around to. So did somebody get rid of some curtains? And it's like, mm. ooh, once again, you have no gay friends. Like not even that one bad. who's in the closet. Oh, that bad. Yeah, because l listen, we gays. It's like you know that expression when you see something, say something. We usually apply that for terrorism or like bags left somewhere in an airport or train station. That's us with fashion. Right. If we see something, we have to say something. It's almost like OCD. <laughs> it's like, girl, no, because so if nobody's told her. At least she, not only does she not have any open gay friends, she doesn't have any even that are in the closet around her. She just has none. Mm. It's very sad. <laughs> so, um, and there, there's there been some comments also on the web about some stuff. It's like, yeah, you have no gay friends. <laughs> tell me you've never met a, tell me you're not aware you've ever met a gay person. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you're talking about us like you know us and <laughs> clearly you don't. <laughs> Based on your comment, if that's your opinion of us. You've never met any of us. <laughs> I'm just like, sorry. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, yeah, back to school is wonderful and it's going on all across the country today. Day. Um, Quebec started last week. I'm not sure if there's other provinces that start earlier. Quebec is unique in that. Um, but it is starting off everywhere except, of course, in uh, Jasper because school there is delayed. Right. Um, there are some, uh, there were some arrangements I heard earlier that were being made to send some of the kids who go to school in Jasper and other places uh, to bus them uh, there. Uh, some of them could be far enough away. Um, but they are working on getting the school ready, according to the CBC on the radio. The target date is the 17th of September to try okay. to get something open there. Um, but uh, that hasn't started. It hasn't started yet. Uh, here we go. T. Wigmore, Kit T. Wigmore tells us Alberta was last week, I think. That, that's quite possible. Uh, Mishatika says that Mateo and Rain starts tomorrow. To, there's a PD day where they are, I believe. That's in London, Ontario, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, so the different things are starting uh, here in uh, Kingston. Uh, my sweetie, if technically officially starts today, um, but for today, the first day is an orientation day, so there are technically no classes yet. Um, so he will uh, officially be in class next Tuesday for the first time, because apparently all his classes, all his teaching hours are all on Tuesday, despite that he's pretty mm -hmm. much full time. Uh, but then he has some alternate delivery uh, stuff that has to be done at, uh, at other times. Here's my, uh, this was my... Uh photo of day well f school photo day so this wouldn't have been the first oh, day of school okay. this is school photo day in 1984 so september of 1984 when i tried to grow my hair out mm. oh, yes i remember that yeah you showed me that photo i remember that smile that, that's the i'm up to no good smile it's because I had a mouthful of braces smile. I know, I know, but that's enough. I'm, I'm up to no good smile. <laughs> and, and, and my buddy, my buddy Stu is like, bro, you got a Jufro. I'm like, but I'm not Jewish. Goes, that's a Jufro. That's yep. a Jufro. I'm like, okay, if you say so. You know, I'll or, take. Or, or either I'm not, I'm up to no good or keep smiling. People will wonder what I'm up to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and okay so now here's another photo i'm going to share with you which is kind of funny because this would have been this is 2012 and it, it's not it, this would have been a pseudo back to school because i was actually working in a school that day 
it would okay. have been, I think, the third day of the, the school week back in 2012. Um, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> now that's a mustache. <laughs> Suddenly I want to ride my bike. You, you've you seen worse, though. You've seen worse. <laughs> yes, post, yes, yes. Post beard when I had the... But anyway, yes, I yes, thought that was yes. funny. Kid Swanky Ghost says, says, that's my hair, too. Mm. <laughs> ah, I love it. Love and, it, and of course, it, the, the sixth grade when I had long, luxurious hair. Check this out. This is sixth grade. So this would have been 1977, 78, 79, okay. something like 78, I think. Yeah. Mm. Fall of 78. Uh, now, now I've got the bare naked song, bare naked lady song in my head. This is me, grade, grade nine. nine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was grade six. So, anyway, funny stuff. Uh, all right. Uh, and uh, if you are in Ontario, kids and cubs, uh, our Minister of Education um, has decided that uh, there are new rules that bans the use of cell phone in classes, and they're taking effect this week. Critics say they're unsure how the regulations will be enforced or how effective they will be. But in April, the Ontario government announced a plan to standardize measures on cell phone use in classrooms, saying it wanted to remove distractions from learning time. While the province had already put in certain restrictions on cell phones in 2019, the new rules set more specific guidelines that are broken down by grade. Starting this week, students in kindergarten to grade 6 must keep cell phones on silent and out of sight for the entire school day. For students in grade 7 to grade 12, cell phones cannot be used during class time. The province has said cell phones may only be used if permitted by an educator or if students have mm. special education or medical needs. Uh, while the overall aim of reducing distractions is welcome, teachers' unions say they need clarity on how the rules should be enforced and support for educators that have to implement them. Principals don't know what it means. School boards are all kind of all over the place, said Renee Jansen in the wall, president of the Ontario. Sorry, Renee Jansen in the wall. I thought in was a uh, a contraction. Uh, I actually don't know what element of speech it is. I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, I didn't think it was part of her name, so that's why I screwed up. Okay. But, uh, Renee Jensen in the wall, president of the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association. Quote, I have teachers calling me who are just beside themselves. Teachers are unclear on what happens if they confiscate a phone and it gets damaged or stolen in the process or what staff should do if a student reacts violently to their phone being taken away. And that's the part I think that they're more concerned about. It's, almost, it's, it's the same thing as back in the day when the, we had the uh, vaccine passports and people were wondering, well, what if somebody asks for someone to have a vaccine passport and they decide to get violent or you say, you can't come in. We saw lots of video evidence of that or aggressive or whatnot. It's like the mm-hmm. person that's at the, the, the Walmart greeter who's getting paid minimum wage is like, you know what? Walk right in yeah, yeah. because uh, it, it's not worth it to me. Thank you very yeah. much or at the lcbo when they were stealing stuff you said yeah just just let them leave yeah and, and people I said, said oh I, I, I'm, I'm not going to stand up and try to stop a 32 ball dollar, dollar bottle of whiskey being stolen and actually get my face punched or slapped no, or, or, or stabbed, stabbed or, or, or whatever spit on or yes it's it, and you know i've i've uh seen you don't pay me enough for that I, i've seen it take place where a guy walked in grabbed a bottle and walked right out and they said no, just leave it be. We don't even stop them. We don't do anything. Yep. There is security sometimes at the front mm-hmm. door at some stores that will take care of it, but the staff does not. Nor should they. Nor should they. They're not being right? paid for that. No. And and then I've seen instances in Toronto, and I have I don't know if it's taking place here in Ottawa, but I've seen instances in Toronto where a group have walked in, grabbed a shopping cart, filled it full, and just walked out. And people tried to, staff tried to, not staff, but uh, uh, clients, customers. customers. Thank you tried to stop them and, and staff was like, just let it go. Just let it go. It's not worth it. Somebody's like, how do they do this? So brazen in the daylight because they know they can get away with it. But here's the thing. They're not actually getting away with it. They're walking out the door with a, a cart full of alcohol, but every single one of them are on high definition cameras. Yeah. It's do it. It's, it's just not do it now. It's do it later. Yeah. You're getting caught. It's just not at the moment. You're getting caught later and it is yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The government has said that students who don't abide by the rules will be asked to put their phones in a safe space in the classroom. If they don't comply, they'll be asked to go to the principal's office. David Mastin, first vice president of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, said there are questions about how effective the rules will be. The principal will deal with them, and then what happens five minutes later is that child returns to class. 
These are the things that are on the ground and that we don't yet have answers on, he said. Karen Littlewood, president of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, said she's concerned about the burden on teachers. Quote, a lot is expected of teachers right now. Education Minister Joel Dunlop, the new education minister, because Leche uh, got shuffled out, and then we had Todd Smith, and then Todd Smith decided that he wanted to leave for a position in the energy industry, mm-hmm. which is really interesting because his background pre-politics didn't have anything to do with energy, but oh well. <clears throat> wasn't a natural career progression based on what his field of expertise was. Let's just put it that way. Somebody uh, failed forward quite well, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, Several provinces are cracking down on cell phone use in class this fall. Last week, British Columbia announced a bell-to-bell restriction on phones. Earlier in August, Saskatchewan announced that students won't be allowed to use cell phones in class in the new school year. Manitoba, Alberta, Quebec, and Nova Scotia have also moved to restrict cell phone use in class. Littlewood, with the Secondary Teachers Union, argued that the Ontario-wide rules for cell phones in schools are, quote, not the biggest issue in education right now. Quote, what we need to be doing is addressing the broader issues in education, like class sizes that are too big, unqualified teachers in the classroom, unable to fill positions within education, and lack of resources and support, she said. And uh, when we're talking about class sizes in Alberta, uh, I saw some tweets uh, going on over Labor Day weekend about some people that found out that one of their classes, I think it's elementary school, will have 53 kids in it. Mm. 53. That's way too much. It's like That's when, entirely too much. When we read uh, what was recommended by the Alberta Teachers Association, I think, uh, you know, um, just between 23 and 27, depending on the grade, it can hit up to 30 when you're like grade 10 to grade 12. But after that, like, but that's about it. 53, more than two to one. So I have, depending a, on the grade. I'm not going to show this photo, but uh, Vim sent me a photo for, of her when she was, I, I don't know what grade you're in in this photo. Oh, yes. She's like brown Farrah Fawcett. And I'm like, damn, girl, you fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Vim's a very elegant lady. Oh yeah, but this is like like. Well, it was that, that was a high school photo. Settle down, ma'am. <laughs> Bridget's over here flabbergasted that I would say something like that. It's not rude. She's very pretty. It's not no. rude if it's true. It's not rude if it's true. <laughs> Settle down. That was a high school photo. Let's see it. Let's see it. Let's see it. It's, I, I don't have permission to share oh, it yet. So. okay. Kid Vim, let us know if you've seen it. And kids, if you have uh, any uh, pictures of, uh, of you in school uh, and you want us to take a look at them or show them, please do. Please do. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, yes. Let's see what else. What have I got here? Uh, many school boards have already developed their own cell phone policies before the province's new rules were announced, Littlewood said, adding that she's spoken to teachers who feel the new man won't change much. Maston, with uh, the Elementary Teachers Union, also said the new policies, quote, do very little. To address deeper problems, he pointed to cyberbullying, violence, and harassment in schools as major concerns for educators. Quote, those are the issues we needed to be addressed, and they weren't. Because, once again, the conservatives controlled something that they could Mm. to create the illusion of action because they've got no solutions, answers, or intentions of doing anything about the real problems. At the Toronto District School Board, the board's code of conduct already says mobile divorce devices are only to be used for education purposes. The board said it has briefed staff on the new province-wide rules. TDSB administrators and staff have been provided with detailed information regarding the minimum requirements for cell phone mobile device use in school to be implemented for September, spokesperson Emma Moynihan wrote in an emailed statement. The Peel District School Board said principals would be working with staff, students, parents, and guardians to, quote, facilitate understanding of the new requirements. This will place, take place through assemblies, conversations, and collaborations in schools, it wrote in an update to the parents. In northern Ontario, the Rainbow District School Board, I like the name of that, <laughs> said it would be working to, quote, foster positive school climates for students. Eliminating distractions will protect instructional time and enable educators and students to focus on teaching and learning, Director of Education Bruce Bourget wrote in a statement. Along with its new cell phone rules, the province is also banning vaping on school property. Yes, starting this academic year. Why did they wait so long? Vaping's been a thing for about a decade a at least while. now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Kit Fim says, go ahead. Okay. All right. Just, I, I wanted to make sure. I don't want to don't 
just show without without you know permission. So here we go. This is uh, the lovely Vim when she was uh, but a high school girl. Oh Round my! Faucet. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. Right. You needed a wind machine with that. Yeah. Mm, fashion. Yes. Look at that smile. Million dollar smile. Yes. Woo. Lovely, lovely. We like it. Mm. Back to school must have you might, you were popular, weren't you? <laughs> I hope you were. <laughs> you would have been popular with me, that's for sure. Mm. Oh yeah. No, no. I there's something in the eyes when you look at people as like, you're cool. Mm-hmm. Because I was very I was very attracted to cool people. So um Yes, because I was totally uncool <laughs> when I was a kid. Oh my God, I was the furthest thing from cool. I think I was in university the first time somebody said I was cool. I was out there going like, what? When did I get promoted? It was like everything that was uncool about me in high school because I was different was cool about me because I was in university because I was my own person. Mm-hmm. So kids or parents, if you have some kids who are in high school who are watching like this and they feel a little bit like an outcast. Wait. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Somebody's going to find you cool. It's just it's just time released. <laughs> well, you know, we, we, we all come into our own at one point or uh, in time or another. And you have to do remember, and, and, and if any, look, we don't have really a, a high school audience on this program, but right. um, I think the, the bulk of our audience is between 24 and 35 right now. If I looked at the, the most recent... Um, most recent demographs, uh, but for those of you who, who may be watching, who are, you know, starting your last year of high school and maybe you've thought, well, I'm not cool. I'm not this. I'm not that. Don't worry about it. 90% of the cool kids in high school, they've peaked. They've already peaked. That's it. I, and I'm not trying to downplay anybody. If you're a cool kid in school, I hope you continue to be a cool kid for the rest of your life. And I hope you find uh, a, a happiness. I hope you find a career that is fulfilling. I, honestly, I mean that because I don't, I don't wish harsh things on anyone. But for those of you who are feeling like I'm left out, I'm the last one, don't worry. Your day does come to you. And the best part is it'll come to you at a point in time in your life when you have a lot more self-confidence, when you feel better about yourself, when you know what you're doing is what you're supposed to be doing. The imposter syndrome may stick with you. Maybe it won't. Some people it sticks with forever. Myself, I have that often. I have days when I feel that. Then I have days when I'm like, no, I got this. I know exactly what I'm doing. We're only human and and we're going to feel those emotions. But please understand that if you're going back to school today and you're struggling with, you know, I'm the last one picked at the sports team. I'm the last one picked for this or that. Don't worry about it. This is but a mere blip in the timeline of your life. Don't let it change the rest of your life for the worse. Use it for the better. Hey, you didn't get picked today. That's okay. Next week, next month, next year, next decade, I'm the one doing the picking. Right. Remember that. Right. Indeed. That is... Those are words of wisdom a little early today, Mr. Grizzly. Well, you know. I agree. I agree very much. Um, also in oh education news. Oh, my goodness. Wait till you see these photos. Miss Shattuck, can I share these? Because if I can share them, I'd like to. <laughs> we got some back-to-school photos. Yay. Oh, Miss Shattuck, when they were, but we young lads. We young ones, I should say. Uh, Kid Pim says that picture was from, the, uh, those were my ACDC days. Oh, Nice. <laughs> Argus Acres Aquanet was awesome, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> My God, that that would hold. Ooh, the aqua. Of course, your hair was like crispy. <laughs> but <laughs> oh my God, yes, I remember Aquanet. Oh my God. <laughs> this, this from Mr. Jim is a, is a story I told on this show once. Neil Armstrong and Neil Gaiman. Mm. Uh, they both have imposter syndrome, and and. The story was Neil Gaiman was at this um, convention somewhere, a symposium or something, and all these incredible accomplished people were speaking. And he meets this other gentleman. He goes, hey, my name's Neil too. And he goes, hey, how you doing? So they have a nice chat. 
And he says, sir, you've, you, you, yeah, you know, you're in the right place. This is where you should be. He goes, no, don't be ridiculous. He goes, all I did was, I just did what they told me and went where they told me to go. He's like, yes, but you did set foot on the moon. <laughs> so yeah. even Neil Armstrong, the first human being to set foot on the moon, had imposter syndrome. Mm. Yeah. So think about that. Yeah. One of the most accomplished pilots in the history of the world, the man who landed on the moon, put his foot down and spoke those famous words. He felt like an imposter too. Yep. There you go. We all do so at some point. We all do. I don't care. Look, I one have. of the best pieces of advice I ever gave to a friend of mine when she was really struggling in her career, she's like, what are they going to do when they find out I don't know what I'm doing? I'm like, oh, sweetheart, nobody knows what they're doing. Welcome to the world. <laughs> Literally. I go, your boss doesn't know what she's doing either. We're all faking it because we all feel the same way. Mm -hmm. There, I'm sure there's a handful of people on this earth and many of them are just narcissists <laughs> who I never this, ever, don't worry, who never ever feel a second of self doubt or anxiety. I'm sure there are those people in this world. I've yet to meet a single one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Kit Vim here says, uh, I've got, because Kit Vim's a teacher, so I've got 30 in my class and I find it a lot. So uh, there you go. I think uh, Kit Angela, Jordan's mom, said uh, you sent us some photos too, but I do not know to where you sent them. So please uh, let us know in the chat. Oh my God. Is that Miss? Miss Shattuck, yeah. But she's oh, you're adorable. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I could eat here, you with a spoon. That's so cute. His, uh, Mohan on his uh, first day of school. I assume it's Mohan. Uh -huh. Let's see if we can get this to load up here. There we go. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Okay. First of all, fashion, too. But as his eyes and the way he's gripping that chair, he looks like he's terrified. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Woo. Wow. We have some, uh, we have some very, uh, now I understand why the kids are the fan, fans of the show so far. We have some very, uh, kids that were very fashionable back mm. in the day. And probably still are because once fashionable, that kind of sticks with you. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> um, oh boy. Here. <laughs> Sorry. I just saw something that made me go, well, this is, um, it's off topic, but I have to show it to you because it's one of those things that honest to goodness, this is not even an ADHD thing. This is one of these things that, because we discuss this on the show frequently, um, this is from Bad Medical Takes. Vaccines do not stop you catching or spreading illnesses. Do you think polio and smallpox were just a myth? Don't know anyone who's had either of those either. Why do you think that is? You're almost there, Keely. You're, You're almost, almost there. there. You're almost there. <laughs> God. Take that last step, girl. Take that last that, step. You're that close. You're that close. Almost. It's like we the carpet's there and your nose is here, and all you need to do is rub your nose in the carpet. <laughs> Take you're right, away. you're right there. You're right there. You're right there. Uh that, that see, that's what I call working hard not to get it. Mm -hmm. Working hard not to get it. Um now this is a, an article from uh back in March 2024. Um there was an article in the CBC that says many Ontario schools are facing daily staff shortages. Data suggests every day more than a quarter of public schools are short on teachers. Nearly half don't have enough EAs. Um, and that was a report by the advocacy group People for Education. They found that 24% of elementary schools and 35% of secondary schools are experiencing daily teacher shortages. And they're even higher for educational assistants who support children with special needs with nearly half of elementary and secondary schools reporting they're short-staffed each day. Findings from the report were based on 1,030 responses to an annual survey collected from principals across 70 of Ontario's 72 publicly funded school boards, which represents 21% of the publicly funded schools in the province. Um, things that was at the April of last year, this year, as school starts, um, New school year offers no relief for Canadian teachers amid ongoing shortages. 
Mm. So uh, uh, well, now we reported, I remember, uh, a couple of days ago about uh, Quebec, uh, which last year they were over 5,000 staff short, and this year they were just about 1,000 or a little yeah. more over 1,000, so they were doing better, but they, uh, they weren't there. Um, but this is, uh, it seems that the numbers were, were adjusted because uh, it's here in this article, it says, two weeks ago, Quebec's education minister, Bernard Réville, announced that 5,704 teaching positions were still vacant, which is a little more than the 1,000 that I had reported on originally. Um, oh, sorry, so I, hang I, on. All right, I got, a, I got a correction for you here. That was not Mohan. That was, this is Mohan and, and his little brother. Oh, my God. <laughs> We have, to correct. Uh, we have to correct. We have to correct when we make mistakes. So who was the first one? Uh, that was Mohan's little brother. Oh, Mohan's little brother, the first one. Yeah, okay. Apparently Mohan gotcha. said I sent the wrong one. This is him and his brother. So there we go. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Good, good. Coordinated whites, like you're about to play tennis. In mm -hmm. Wimbledon. There we go. Um, so yes, uh, the stress and frustration that I know is going to come when I won't have the resources I need or don't have the support because the system is not robust, it's not sustainable, said Gupreet Baines, a leading support teacher at a high school in Surrey, BC. It's just running on kind-heartedness of teachers, she told uh, the CBC. Teachers in BC are not the only ones with understaffed public schools. As I mentioned, Quebec has 5,704 5 teaching, teaching positions still vacant. The reasons for the shortage in Canada are numerous. In Quebec, a growing student population has caused challenges in the school system. Because Quebec is uh, the province that accepts the most uh, asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, all of a sudden, uh, I think they have like 20,000 new students uh, to, in, in the new cohort uh, this year entering uh, the education system. In BC, the decline in teachers has been linked to a range of issues, including rising housing costs and teachers retiring early during the pandemic. Bain said the shortage is driven by poor working conditions and lack of funding, leaving teachers like her, quote, doing a lot more with a lot less. It's not a greedy teacher asking for more money, or it's not a teacher asking for more prep time. It's because it's needed. Following the pandemic, Surrey School Superintendent Mark Pierre Pearman said, quote, the biggest item that we really, sorry, the biggest item that really has been hitting them is population growth. We're growing as a system, not just in Surrey, but in British Columbia, said Pearman. We were able to recruit teachers from Ontario, Alberta, and vice versa, but we're all in the same boat at this point in time. Permain, uh, Perman also says that teachers' shortage is international, with colleagues in the UK, Australia, and, quote, other Western nations facing similar challenges. Hmm. Maybe um, politicians spending their time bashing teachers mm -hmm. constantly and talking about them like they're worthless as they do for our current prime minister and as they're doing for the U.S. vice presidential nominee or candidate, Tim Walz, mm -hmm. and any other nations where teachers decide, you know what, uh, they're going to enter politics. Yeah, it's, it's not funny. a good idea. It's funny how they, you know, they, they dump all over experts and expertise. And when an expert steps in, they dump all over them again. And they call us liberal elites, yet when a bus driver becomes a member of parliament or the uh, mayor of a city, they dump all over him, but they talk about common... Do you not see a recurring theme here, folks? They call us elites, but when a regular person takes a job in politics, they dump on that person. They hate working people. That's all it is. They hate unions, they hate working people, they hate those of us who can stand up on our own two feet, support ourselves, and support our own community. They hate us for it. I'm not being hyperbolic here. They've proven it time and time again, mm -hmm. as evidenced by this. So the federal government's new child food program starts tomorrow and Pierre probably ever wants to cut it because it hasn't fed a single child yet. Right. So he's been taking lessons from me, <laughs> but, but it's that, that's, that's, that's attitude that I have. There. Sounds like children, Pierre doesn't want children to be fed. Yes. 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 The, the program doesn't exist yet, hasn't fed a single child yet. Uh, yeah, do you think that's possibly because the program was announced in April and... Uh, it starts in September and... Ah. Uh, 
He wants to crush it before but, it begins. But this is his thing. He's been doing this constantly on everything. I'm not going to comment on something that doesn't exist yet. Why would I oppose it? It doesn't exist yet. Because he did it with dental care. He did it with uh, uh, God knows what it is. I mean, th- this is like the third or fourth time that he does this. Here's an example. He voted against the Canada Child Benefit, called the $10 a day child care a slush fund, a liberal slush fund, actually, he called it. Voted against the Canadian Dental Care Plan, voted against climate action over 400 times. Help raise the retirement age from 65 to 67. Yeah. He hates you. He oh, wants yeah. your vote so he can have power over you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the conditions in classrooms are also uh, coupled with the changing nature of employment. With remote work and flexible hours being options now, Permain says that people ask, quote, do I want a traditional nine to five job or do I want some flexibility? Isabelle Allaire, a French teacher at Lester B. Pearson English School Board in Montreal, has seen the impact on students when teachers are called to substitute and teach in subjects outside of their expertise. Quote, it has been an ongoing problem, especially in my field. There is a great shortage of French second language teachers, and every year it's the same song and dance. We're looking for more teachers. According to Allaire, a teacher's steady presence in the classroom creates routine and structure that motivates students to learn and thrive. Without that, quote, the lack of structure and the lack of expertise will be very apparent and the students will suffer, she said. Judy Kelly, Chair Pearson of the Lester B. Pearson School Board in Quebec, says there's a demand for French teachers across Canada that isn't being met. It's probably the largest challenge we have is to find qualified French first or second language teachers, she said, noting there's a draw for some teachers into the college system. Additionally, she says that fewer people are going into the teaching profession, quote, whether they specialize in French or they're from a French university and education program. Staff shortages take a toll on teachers when they are forced to become, quote, jack of all trades, says Baines. If a colleague is away, other teachers at that school are asked to cover their classes if the school is unable to find a substitute. Quote, you're doing something else that you're maybe not familiar with. For example, I'm a language teacher as well, and I may be covering a college colleague's math classroom or PE classroom or a metal shop workshop, she said. Filling in for other teachers also takes Baines, who is a learning support teacher, away from her own students. Quote, this means that your most vulnerable learners, students with high needs and who need one-on-one attention, are not getting it. This is very stressful, not only on the students and families. Many teachers will probably go under the grill trip that, hey, I'm here, I'm showing up, but I'm not doing my job right. Teacher recruitment is at the top of Permain's list of solutions to the shortage. Quote, we really strive to ensure that we have qualified teachers in front of our kids each time. We continue to try and find full-time folks because ideally we'd like to have the consistency in front of the kids for every class that we can. He also says that metro schools are learning from schools in the North that have dealt with this issue for about a decade. Quote, the North has started trying signing bonuses and retention bonuses, and they're meeting some success there. Ontario supply teacher Matt Cote uh, from the York Region District School Board said he believes retaining teachers and recruiting new ones hinges on cultivating more respect for the teaching profession. You think? Quote, to me, respect means looking at what responsibilities we're asking from teachers, what resources we're providing them to meet those responsibilities, and making sure we really, we're really setting them up for success in the best way possible. CBC reached out to the York Region District School Board and Ontario Ministry of Education for comment about the reason behind teacher shortages and solutions to the problem, but did not receive a response by publication time. That seems to be the consistent line uh, when um, the media is calling the government of Ontario for further explanation. But they didn't return our calls. They weren't available at time. They, they didn't respond before publication time. They could not make anyone available. Government's hiding from us. If you're in Ontario, government's hiding from you. Yes. Alaire, too, said she wishes people had a better understanding of how complex and multifaceted teachers' jobs have become over the years. She said her job includes, quote, being mentor, coach, advisor, troubleshooter, and conflict manager on top of teaching French. I think aspiring teachers are afraid of that workload because they know that right now it's not being respected and it's not being valued. Yes, it's multifaceted, but it's so rewarding because of the bonds that you develop with the students. Um, So that's the situation in classes here. Uh, Now, in Alberta, uh, according to National News Watch, uh, Alberta is set to pursue legislation this fall on opt-in sex education in schools. Uh, The Alberta government says it's moving ahead this fall with legislation that will require parents to proactively sign up to have their children opt-in rather than the usual practice of opting out for sex education. It's a move that has teachers wondering what problem the province is looking to solve. 
Education Minister Dimitrios Nikolaidis in a statement said, school boards, teachers, superintendents, and parents are being consulted. Quote, we intend to propose legislation this fall and will continue to consult with stakeholders throughout the implementation of these policies. It's not clear what the legislation might look like, but Premier Smith said in February it would involve parents opting in their children to each formal lesson on sexual health. To each formal lesson? So is she talking about like giving somebody a permission slip for each actual lesson and not just the course in general? Aren't the conservatives the people who are against creating additional layers of bureaucracy? No, 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 no. If it's for if it's for every single lesson, is they're trying to create a situation where people opt out because it's just too burdensome. That's that that's a policy. Say like, no, no, you can have sex education. We're just going to make it a total bitch for you to actually get it. Huh. Outside resources or presentations would also need to be approved by the education ministry. Yay. Jason Schilling, president of the Alberta Teachers Association, said that there are a lot of unanswered questions after spring consultation about the proposed bill. And if you're in Alberta, uh, the mo one of the most recent episodes of the breakdown with Nate uh, is a discussion with uh, Mr. Schilling from the Alberta Teachers uh, Association. So uh, please check that out. He said sex ed is taught using materials vetted by Alberta Health Services and parents are already given the chance to opt their children out of the classes. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily understand what was broken that needed to be fixed. When we pressed government, there was no real understanding of what this would look like. The public school divisions in Edmonton and Calgary have said they are waiting for more information from the province. Quote, requiring parents to opt in does not serve to add any additional parental control, Edmonton Public School Board Chair Julie Kushik wrote in a letter to Smith. She said sex ed, sex ed is factual and age-appropriate, and opt-in models only adds administrative red tape for schools. See? Mm -hmm. Opposition NDP education critic Amanda Chapman said United Conservative Party government's, quote, bizarre proposal creates information barriers and distracts people from issues like underfunded schools and overclouded classrooms, especially if you have a leadership review coming. Yeah. She added that uh, the province's current opt-out model is working. Quote, we haven't seen complaints from parents about that. I'm not entirely sure what the motivation would have been. The fall legislature setting is uh, set, sitting is set to begin in late October. Chapman said before that the premier needs to be open about who was consulted and how the legislation will benefit students. She's never open about this. And when it comes to the whole pronoun thing, uh, every single premier so far in the nation that has pursued that in some way has been completely opaque with regard to uh, who asked for this and how did you come to this decision and what expertise did you rely on? Mm -hmm because nobody asked for it really and there is no expertise that recommends it they actually can't answer the question or if they did answer it honestly um, it would kind of go against all the rationales that they said for which they're doing this in the first place so we can't have that can oh, we goodness no yes um, Schilling said the proposed law could have students missing out on valuable information at a time when Alberta is experiencing high rates of sexually transmitted infections Preliminary data from the province says cases of gonorrhea ticked up 1,334 in the first quarter of 2024 from 1,247 in the same period in 2022. Chlamydia also went up to 4,234 cases from 4,030. Dr. Amita Singh, an infectious disease specialist with the University of Alberta, said higher rates could be tied to people across the prairies using stimulant drugs like meth or less likely to practice safer sex and connect with multiple or anonymous partners. A lack of education could also be a reason for higher rates of sexually transmitted infections, said Katie Ayers of Safe Link, Alberta, a Calgary nonprofit focused on reducing risks to tied to sexual activity and substance use. Ayers said that there's a lot of flip-flopping over which topics get discussed in sex ed, including sexual health, consent, physiology, and sexuality. The solutions he suggested may start at home. I would encourage folks to think about it as their responsibility more as a parent instead of assuming that schools will be covering everything. It's just a reiteration of what's been covered in school, then that's great. But chances are parents will bring up some things that kids have not heard. Um, also in Alberta, um, Daniel Smith has uh, promised uh, to go ahead uh, with her gender policy um, that, again, nobody asked for. Uh, but, uh, yeah. And uh, just a reminder that... Uh, when uh, she came out with those policies, um, when they were asking her, um, you yeah, know, what problem are you trying to fix here? Um, 
she wasn't actually trying to fix a problem. Um, she said stuff like, there have been some organizations advocating for those treatments to be done younger and younger, and I guess I'm uncomfortable with that. Uh, well, tough cookies, learn to cope with your feelings. I don't want any child to feel regret for their discussion, their decision or feel that they made it prematurely. That's why we want to make sure we take the extra time so that those kids are making the decisions so that they can live with the consequences. Um, she's basically saying the entire time that she's doing this to prevent things that have not happened yet under the policy that allowed it from happening in the future. So she's not, it's almost like pre-crime. Mm. Yeah, very similar to it. Huh? Except it's not a crime. Wanting to be called what you identify as is not a crime. So yeah, uh, so she's not, she's not, she's doing this preemptively. She's not even res responding uh, to an issue. So, um, but yes, uh, again, leadership review coming. So uh, she's throwing something to uh, the red meat base here. Uh, so by wanting to say, uh, parents, you're now going to opt in to sex ed. Look at how much more power you have, whether you opt in or you opt out. It's the same thing. It's just a different process. It's literally action for action's sake to create the illusion mm -hmm. of being attentive. It but uh, it adds layers of bureaucracy and it makes it more difficult for people to access especially if you have to approve every lesson, participation in every lesson, and not just, okay, for the next five weeks, we'll be doing the sexual education block. Do you want your kid pulled out for the next five weeks? Or it's like if it's absolutely every lesson that contains something that could be related, that's a lot of paperwork, a lot of permission slips. Uh, so that's what's going on in Alberta education-wise. And I believe I had one more back to school story for us, uh, kids and cubs here. Um, or maybe that is everything. Just taking a look here. Oh, yes. The BC conservative leader outlines his views on energy and education and podcast appearance. This also is from National News Watch um, because, as we mentioned, there's been some uh, changes in BC. And uh, the BC United Party has essentially folded and um, for all intents and purposes joined the BC Conservative Party. Uh, however, the BC Conservative Party seems to be uh, led by a man who uh, is, uh, has a, also has an issue with uh, trans kids, uh, also has a problem with um, climate change being a real thing. Mm. He was actually on TV the other day saying, like just the other day, saying he doesn't think it's an existential threat. Still, um, probably doesn't support safe uh, consumption sites. Oh. So you know all the stereotypical things. Um, so uh, I'm not sure how in British Columbia a premier who's uh, not pro environment, not pro trans kids, and not pro uh, safe consumption sites is going to do uh, in an election. And in any place that is not the BC interior, mm -hmm. the BC interior, they'll probably get elected in a landslide victory. But in in uh, in Vancouver, the greater metro area, no, yeah. not a. Not That's a, what I'm yeah. saying is his gamble to um, uh, appeal to that that uh, group. Well, not to appeal to that group, but to the you know the whole BC United, like let's all unite the right, and now mm -hmm. now that we've united the right, let's now adopt the most extreme positions on everything. You're you're gonna you're gonna lose your moderates. Oh yes, <clears throat> you're gonna lose your moderates here. Well, I've um, I've a, I have a story for you um, from Torstar. Okay, hold um, it hold it for one second. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, in the episode which runs just over an hour and forty five minutes, Rusted and Peterson. Oh yes, he was talking to Jordan Peterson. Of course he was. Of course, his first prior priority. Why? Uh, anyway. I'm just, I was about to go in, why do everybody need to bend the knee and kiss the kisses ring? But we know why. It's because he's got a big audience, and these are the people that they're trying to talk to. Um, speaking on an episode of Canadian psychologist Jordan, well, can we still call him a psychologist? Uh, I don't I honestly, I guess he I don't still know. is because, yes, he still has to show up for his, uh, his uh, re-education training, training. <clears throat> allegedly. Yes. Uh, 
So speaking on a, an episode of his podcast release Monday, Rustad said he also wants to get rid of the carbon tax, which he says taxes people into poverty, quote, in quote, a vain attempt to change the weather. I don't know how that's going to work out. No, no, we're, nobody's trying to change the weather. People are trying to prevent the planet Catastrophic from climate warming change. to yes. a degree that would bring catastrophic events on the regular, not to change the weather. Again, if you do not know this, you should not even be attempting to lead a province. Uh, in the episode, which runs just over an hour and 45 minutes, Rusted and Peterson discussed a variety of topics, including his revival of the BC Conservative Party as an, edu as an election contender, energy and education policy, and, quote, cancel culture. Rustad says the education system in British Columbia, quote, is teaching kids what to think rather than how to be critical thinkers. Mr. Rustad, you don't want more critical thinkers. God, no. They don't want that. that. That's a lie. And some materials in the system, quote, are designed for more of an indoctrination than teaching kids important skills. Oh, my God. The party leader also says it was crazy for the former BC Liberal Party to have banned nuclear power, saying the provinces need to have a conversation about reconsidering its position, tying high energy costs to lower living standards, blah, blah, blah. But uh, yeah, okay, so we basically know what uh, his stance on education is. Uh, teachers are there to corrupt your children, and they're all evil. Yeah, yeah. okay. Thank you. Next. Yeah, um, i kidding. Yeah, not uh, not impressed with this guy already. Hopefully, you know what? Hopefully, this is one another situation of just keep him talking, keep him talking. Well, like I said, I've got a I've got a story here. I want to I want to relay to you. Uh, and this is this involves healthcare. It involves conservatives, and it, and it involves supervised consumption sites uh, from the Toronto Star. This is called a, a, a contributing uh, individual, an opinion piece. It's called in their own voices. Mm. And, and the lead is, I've used a Toronto supervised consumption site for a year. What it's really like in these facilities, Doug Ford is bent on shuttering. The Ford government announced plans to close most supervised consumption sites in Ontario, the very places that have changed my life, writes Kevin Wilson. Instead of quicksand threatening to engulf me, I feel like I have enough of a toehold, along with the outstretched arms, to finally climb out. Kevin Wilson writes about his local supervised consumption site. Imagine learning that someone you deeply care for has suddenly died and their death was entirely preventable. It's a feeling most addicts have come to know well, especially in the past decade as the street drug supply has grown ever more toxic and lethal. The shock and the grief and the rage, that's pretty much exactly how I felt when I learned that our premier and his minister of health planned to close the Queen West supervised consumption site, along with four other sites in Toronto and f another five across Ontario. I'm not nearly the voracious consumer of news I once was. Addiction and homelessness have a way of doing that to a person, but by some strange coincidence, I decided to have a peek at Google News just a few hours after the Ford government's recent announcement. The news was horrifying, but not a complete surprise. In recent months, conservative politicians at all levels of government across Canada have been using increasingly bellicose rhetoric to attack the harm reduction model of addressing substance use. Supervised consumption sites are perhaps the most visible manifestation of harm reduction. These sites provide a safe environment, sterile tools, and are staffed by healthcare professionals and trained harm reduction workers for people to use drugs with less risk. Taken together, the impending closure of all 10 sites is a gut punch. But the Queen West's supervised consumption sites has particular personal residence. I was buzzed through its doors the first time I had ever availed myself of an SCS about a year ago. That first visit marked the beginning of my long and as yet unfinished climb out of the unbearably dark pit I occupied. For years, I had struggled alone, not just with my addiction, but with a host of other demons, including, but not limited to, burnout, mental illness, and self-loathing. None of that mattered inside the supervised consumption site. I felt welcomed and valued from the moment I stepped inside. I slowly opened up to one worker, Josh. We bonded during one of his breaks over crossword puzzles. He's since moved to another role with another agency, but another harm reduction worker who remains in contact with me told him he asks about me often. I kept coming back. And since that first, first visit, a transformation has taken hold. Words like addict, homeless, and crazy are no longer words that define me. Rather, they've become words that serve to help inform who I have become in the here and now. 
But I am so much more than just those three words. I am a parent, friend, daredevil, raconteur, and despite my best efforts to not be, I am also an activist, apparently. W whatever doubt I may have had about my activism went out the window days ago, courtesy of Doug Ford and Sylvia Jones, and for good reason. The Queen West site provided me with more than a place to safely use drugs. The staff provided medical attention when I needed it, food and snacks when I was hungry, water and juice when I was thirsty, a sympathetic ear and a hug when I despaired. Through them, I was connected with phenomenal support with a phenomenal support worker from Parkdale Queen West Community Health Center, which operates the Queen West Supervised Consumption site. They have been my advocate and biggest supporter. With their help, obstacles that seemed insurmountable have vanished. After I suffered a badly broken arm and required surgery, that worker and their colleagues were able to secure a respite care bed where I could convalesce. When it was time for me to be discharged, staff from the respite care facility and Park Queen West Community Health Center found me a shelter bed. Now, for the first time in what seems like an eternity, I see a path opening to stable, secure housing. Along the way, my drug use has fallen dramatically. Apparently, that's a thing that happens when despair gets replaced with hope. I can't say I've escaped that dark pit, but I no longer feel like I'm sinking. I feel like I have enough of a toehold along with the outstretched arms of, like, of people like Josh and my support worker to finally climb out. None of these things would have ever happened in a place our premier all but labeled a drug den in his announcements. The house where his brother, then Mayor Rob Ford, was filmed smoking crack? That was a drug den. Doug Ford, of all people, should know the difference. Yeah. Kevin Wilson is a recovering journalist, father, daredevil, raconteur, and reluctant activist. Yep. That's a great piece of writing That's by great. an individual who has, what do we call again, kids? Lived experience. Yes. An expert. An actual expert. On what now, it is to live with an addiction. Sticking with health care. And going to get help. Yes. Sticking with health care. Conservative premiers are privatizing health care one province at a time. Now, this is not a secret. We know this. But here's the thing that we need to talk about. From CBC News politics. This report is an aha moment. We talked about this yesterday. The federal government has been paying far more to the provinces than they admit. Federal health transfers increased 212%, but the provinces only increased 158% of your health care. If your health care sucks, blame your premier. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, National News Watch was carrying this as well. It says, despite castigation from provincial premiers over lagging federal contributions to health spending, an analysis of 20 years of health funding data shows that federal transfers have mostly outpaced increases to provincial health budgets. In 2023, federal health transfers amounted to 400, to, sorry, amended, amounted to 47.1 billion dollars, a 212 percent increase over 20 over 2005. Let me try to read that sentence again. Yeah. I tripped over my tongue seven times, in uh, about 13 words. In 2023, federal health transfers amounted to $47.1 billion, a 212% increase over 2005, when the transfers were $15.1 billion. Total spending by all 10 provinces grew in that time to $221.9 billion, up from $86.2 billion, an increase of 158%. Um, math was not always my strongest subject, but I was pretty good in it. But I think I know that 212 is more. The 158. Well, you know, I'm a lot do more. It's quite a bit more. Yeah. A lot more. The Canadian Press, in partnership with Humber College Story Lab, collected data on provincial health budgets and federal health transfers from 2004 to 2023 to track annual spending from the launch of the 2004 Federal Provincial Health Accord under former Liberal Prime Minister Paul Martin. The findings stand in stark contrast to the rhetoric that has punctuated federal and provincial health negotiations over the last several years as health systems struggled in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. Two years ago, a shortage of health workers led to emergency room closures and extreme backlogs for services across the country, and premiers demanded the federal government pay a greater share of the health spending bill while complaining about inflation because the government was spending too much money. And it's this next paragraph that, that just kills me. Ahead, Former Manitoba Premier Heather Stephenson, after a meeting with her fellow provincial leaders at the end of 2022, said health spending used to be split evenly, but the federal share had slowly dwindled over time. That is a lie. It seems it's the other way around. If federal spending had increased, 
provincial spending had decreased. The numbers are here. And where's this story coming from? I'm reading it from CTV. Yep. Some national news watch here. So, um, yeah, um, the premiers are accusing the federal government of what it is that they are, have been doing all along. Uh, governments originally envisioned that health care costs would be divided evenly between Ottawa and provincial governments in 1959, before most provinces even had Medicare. But the funding model shifted drastically in the 70s and has changed again many times since. Rather than slowly dropping off over the last two decades, as the premier suggested, the data shows federal transfers actually grew at a slightly faster pace than provincial health spending since the Martin Health Accord in 2004. I'm going to guess that this is more than slightly faster. In 2005, I mean, we're talking about a difference of like 60%. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. Uh, in 2005, 2006, federal health transfers grew 39% in one year, while provincial health spending grew by 6%. Okay, 39 versus 6 is not slightly faster. It's not slightly If the federal government had increased spending at 9% and the provinces had increased it at 6 that would be slightly faster. 39% versus 6 is not slightly faster. No, no, no. <laughs> words have meanings, people in the media. That, and words are supposed to be your life, especially if you're in print. That meant the federal share of total health spending jumped from 20.7% from 17.5%. Federal health care spending was far higher during the COVID-19 pandemic because of specific transfers. Those extra funds stopped flowing in 2022-2023, which by, by which time the federal share of total provincial spending had grown slightly to 21.2%. 20.7 to 21.2 is an appropriate use of slightly. That really wasn't acknowledged when premiers were clamoring for more federal money after the pandemic, Health Minister Mark Collins said in a recent interview. It was also not acknowledged in his recent negotiations with provinces as part of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's proposed $196 billion health deal, which involves signing one-on-one agreements with each province. I understand the position of the provinces, huge demands on them, but we have been ensuring that we're providing the dollars that are necessary and required to help them in their health systems, Holland said. Now what we need to do is begin to transform how our system functions. We need to move from a crisis-based system where we wait until people are really sick and then we deal with it to being upstream and avoiding illnesses and being engaged in prevention, has said every government for the last 40 years, but you don't do it. But you don't do it. And uh, what we need now, also, Minister Holland, are strings attached. And that's what Linda's saying. Stop those responsible. Yeah, the feds are responsible for this too. They long ago should have made the provinces account for the funds before getting any further federal money. Do I, it. I completely agree. Do it. Yeah. Run on it in the next election. You will yeah. win. Yeah. Run on it. Strings attached. Stop being afraid of asking strings attached because the provinces are going to complain and make us look bad. I don't give a provinces shit. Provinces always make you look bad. Provinces always run against the federal government. That's yeah. been the story for my entire life. I don't give a shit if they make you yes. look bad. They're going Tell to, the people what they're doing. Yes. They're going to try to make you look bad anyway. So make matter. them report. Strings yeah. attached. Come on. Well, how many billions? They're like, all that money during the COVID that, uh, that, 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 that Trudeau printed. I'm like, how many billions did conservative premiers in different provinces across the country go unaccounted for? Oh, no. Now, here's a line. Because we were just talking about this. Ontario mm-hmm. Premier Doug Ford declined the Canadian press's interview request as chair of the Council of the Federation, the official organization of the premiers. Yeah, I wonder why. Gee. A written statement said premiers continue to urge the federal government to provide adequate and sustainable health care funding. Oh, look at that. Premiers asked the Ottawa for more money. News flashed. Can I have more? Bre- I have breaking more? news. For the one million billionth time in my life. <laughs> Also reiterating the concerns that the agreements have an end date. The premiers call the call that the quote funding cliff, fearing they can't plan for long term stability when federal offers all have an expiration date. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. But just because I have to renew my mortgage every five years doesn't mean I can't make plans to keep on paying my mortgage. Yeah. Doug. <laughs> You make the plan, you take the money you got, you start building the system, and then when you renegotiate the new deal, you say, hey, we're three years into building the new system, you can't let it fall now. It will be a huge public relations disaster for you. Give us more money. Yeah. 
but if you take the money and never start building it in the first place, you have you know nothing what? with which to pressure the federal government to say, hey, this might die. You, you know what these premiers are doing? And bear with me while I, while I word this out. Bear with okay. me. What these premiers are doing is what they accuse welfare recipients of doing. Yes. When you get your welfare check on a Friday, you go to the liquor store, spend all your money on liquor and cigarettes, and, and then you have no more money at the end of the month. This is what premiers accuse people who are on social assistance of doing. Yep. And there is a percentage that does that. Yes. Yep. A very small percentage. An incredibly small percentage, so much so that in certain places in, in, in North America, the state of Wisconsin, as an example, when they started doing drug testing to welfare recipients, they yes. didn't catch anyone. Or they caught so few that like it, three, cost, it, three yeah, it cost more to administer the program yes. than they saved in cutting off payments. And discovered that this was a bad idea. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You know why? Because most learn- people like to eat. Yeah, exactly. Well, we spent $40 million testing people like this only, and we discovered that people like eating. Yes. People and love, having a roof over their heads. People yeah. love a roof over their heads, indoor plumbing and electricity, and heat. And, and yes, Linda. They decided to spend on those things first. Who knew? Who knew? With Doug Ford, he is Everyone. literally spending the money on alcohol. Right? Yeah. So they're doing what they accuse... Are- uh, uh, what they accuse the, the percentage of the population that cannot advocate for themselves because they don't have the power or the money or the voice. They're doing what they accuse these folks of doing, which has been proven time and time again that the percentage of folks that do that is very small. And you know what? Who gives a shit? Yep. yep. In, in the sense that how you spend your money is how you spend your money. Yeah. I, I do give a shit when it comes to people who may have an addiction and are not getting the help they need. But then again, we have provincial premiers who are closing the supervised. Do you see the big circle that goes on here, folks? Once you get your money, your money is yours to spend. And you are constitutionally allowed to spend your money unwisely if that's what you wish to do. Do you know how many people I know who earn big money who spend it on the most ridiculous of things? Yeah. It's like the guy, the the thing I was telling you about yesterday, the Northern Albertan, who's a million dollars in debt because he makes 350 a year, but he's got to sell his big speedboat to get a bigger speedboat. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Like all the, listen, there are people that legitimately have it tough. All right. With what they're making. Yes. And a hundred thousand dollars isn't what it was, what it was. No, it's not. Not even close. It's, it's, it's just, you're, you're. The middle class, remember, the middle class cut off in Ottawa, and I don't know what it is as of this this moment, this broadcast, but five years ago, it was Mm $87,000 for a single person living in downtown Ottawa to make ends meet. Five years ago, it was $87,000. I don't know what it is today. So a hundred grand, not a lot of money. I don't even bring that in now. Yeah. Now, things have been tighter for me, as you know, on the show, because interest rates have gone on mortgage, but I'm still doing well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Now, we all know people who are either not good at managing money because they didn't learn the skills, mm-hmm. right? We also know people like this, maybe not currently, but we also have known people that have make interesting spending choices, right? Mm-hmm. On things that they don't want people to know. Yes. Like when you've bought that 12th pair of shoes this well, I month. Don't know what you're I don't know what you're talking about. Or if you have certain habits that you uh, practice alone. No, not me. But coffee is expensive. Coffee. But let's say having the daily coffee at Starbucks rather than having at home. There are, all, there are always decisions that we can make up to a certain point. And then there's a point where we can't cut no more. And yeah. one of those things is the, the keeping up with the neighbors. Keeping yeah, up with the Joneses or always care. needing to have the newest thing. Yeah, but, there, but we all, a lot of us, I, I've watched enough of the sort of like, oh my God, my budget is a mess show. How do I get my budget back in order? And then somebody comes in and says, but I, I need that. No, 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 you don't. Is that a need or, or is that a want? want? Yeah. It does not Distinguishing between not and, but exactly. Distinguishing between, when you, we all know this. Yes. It happens like this. And every one of us, Pretty much every one of us now, if you're living on like, if you're living on social assistance and disability supports and whatnot, 
you don't have any fat to trim. <laughs> it's like there are fair, there are very few spending decisions that you can make more wisely. There, there are very few because you don't have the margin for them to start with. But for a lot of us that are earning salaries, yes, you know, there are there are a couple there are months now and then where uh, my Beaver Sweetie and I did look at the the credit card bill says, oh, uh, yeah, we were lazy this month, weren't we? We mm. didn't cook as much as we <laughs> normally that, that do. That happens because we're human and you get tired. You've had a long day. You don't have the energy to prepare a proper meal. We'll just DoorDash or whatever, right? And, I get it. I occasionally and, do it too, but I don't do it often because I look at what it costs and I go, oh. And money is convenience. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Money is convenience. You're too tired to cook. You happen to have some extra money. You know what? Ordering in. Life is hard enough. Money is convenience. That, that's what it's there for. So, right? But, you know, if in a 31-day month, you've eaten out 17 days, maybe mm -hmm. there are other choices that you can make. You know, I've, 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 I've never eaten avocado toast and I brew my coffee at home and I'm still not a millionaire. Have you considered committing massive fraud? <laughs> <laughs> Here's a solution, printing money. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Somebody did win s the 649 the other night though, because the, the, the new jackpot's late. It was 40 million and now it's down oh, to 12. My. I saw that yesterday when I was walking down the street. I, oh, I didn't buy a ticket, so it wasn't me. Yeah. So, I mean, right and this is all has to, you know, when I'm talking about this, it's also sort of tangentially related to an Algoma plant guy, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm paying 40% tax, but I can't make both ends meet. Um, $50 each time I go to the dentist, bro, I wish. Yeah, well, I've got stuff on that. Some uh, some kids helped uh, help me do some some sleuthing there uh, on that. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, did we have anything else on the, on this particular topic, Mr. Gizzi? So I know you you brought it up, so I don't want you. Yeah, there's, well, there's there's a few different things that I've been I'm trying to kick around here. Um, I just I, things coming across my feed that I pay attention to. Some things are a little less issue. It is you know, it's just, money doesn't solve the problem. Stop wasting money on a system that is broken. Well, hang on a second here. Right. What what, the, what does that mean? Why right. don't we fix the system by insisting that the provinces spend the money on health care or you don't get the money. <sighs> Exasperated. Strings attached. It's not Seriously, difficult. liberals, run on it. I mean it. It's, it's not difficult, and yes, they should run on it. Absolutely. It will get a lot more support than people think here. Mm-hmm. Um, in February 2023, about 10 days after Trudeau tabled the latest health funding offer, the premiers issued a joint statement to reluctantly accept it. Quote, with this first step marks a positive development. The federal approach will clearly not address structural health funding needs nor long-term sustainability challenges we face in our healthcare systems across the country, they wrote. Well, you could start by directing all the money you get to it, premiers, and then deciding what needs to be done. Just saying. Getting a clear view of who's paying the growing cost of Canada's health care isn't straightforward. No government is collecting health spending data. Why? On a national scale. And the federal contributions are difficult to pin down. Why? Hmm. It's important to... Systems can be designed. If the system doesn't allow you to find this out, then design a system that does. Chop, chop. The saying. Um... Oh, I think we may have lost Mr. Grizzly, Kits and Cubs. Um, do you still hear me? Because Mr. Grizzly has uh, frozen on my screen. So uh, do let me know that, Kits and Cubs. It would, oh, there he is. Okay, yeah, it, uh, it just popped up. It said lost connection, reconnecting. I have no idea how that happened. Okay. <laughs> it's just weird. Well, cool. No, just, you're there. Restream it's, was borking yesterday, and it's borking today. So <laughs> It's important to know how much each government is contributing so that voters can hold them accountable, said Heisen Mu a professor with the University of Saskatchewan's Graduate School of Public Policy. Quote, they have certain expectations on the quality and quantity of health care they receive. However, they cannot hold either level of government accountable because there's no clear division of responsibility. There's no clear, no transparent contribution ratio or expectation for this contribution from either government in the system so far. The Canadian Press and Humber College Story Lab combed through decades of provincial public accounts and federal transfers to compile the data manually. Territories were not included because health spending records couldn't be verified in some cases. 
The territories also receive additional support from the federal government to fund a necessary travel and accommodation for some patients that can't be treated near their homes. Because for the territories, there is the provincial deal, but because the deal is by population, and they have such low populations and greater distances and mm -hmm. higher costs, there's an additional pool of money specifically for the territories that is negotiated to cover these type of things. Um, the analysis did not account for equalization payments and other federal contributions to provincial general revenues that could ultimately be spent on health, nor did it look at tax point transfers, which the federal government includes when it assesses how much money it is given to the provinces for health care. That dates back to 1977, when the federal government lowered its tax rates for personal and corporate income, and the provinces could increase their provincial tax rates and take that revenue instead. So, explain that again. Back, way back in 1977 and at several other times since, the federal government has said, okay, we are going to take less of the taxes for us, mm -hmm. so we're going to reduce income tax by 2% so that you, the provinces, can increase your income taxes by 2% yes, to spend that money on health. And then the premiers never acknowledge it happens and then yeah. underspend on health with what they get. It's a nice work if you can get it. In 2023, after the latest health funding offer to the premiers was made public, Ottawa said tax point transfers amounted to $25 billion. However, the province does Provinces do not include tax point transfers when discussing the federal share of health care spending. Holland said he's open to finding a way to make information about health spending more available as a way to cut through the political rhetoric. I think anything that provides transparency and allows us to get to talking about the material consequential things that we have to be doing, as opposed to debating over dollar values, I think is helpful. The new health details call on provinces to improve the collection of national health data, but makes no specific mention of tracking federal and provincial spending. The one thing that is clear is that their healthcare spending is growing. Per capita, Canada's transfers for health grew six times faster than population growth, amounting to $1,115 per person in 2023, up from $427 per person in 2005. With that much of an increase, there was no excuse for the provinces not to be doing well. Those figures have not been adjusted for inflation. Among the provinces, per capita spending grew at a massively different rate, with Newfoundland's budget soaring 19 times faster than its population, while spending in Nova Scotia and Alberta grew then less than two times as fast as the population. So again, Canada grew health transfers six times faster yeah. than population growth. Between 2005 and 2023, Nova Scotia and Alberta grew less than two times as fast as the population. I think I figured out where the Alberta advantage comes from. Not oil. No. It's cheating you on your health dollars. The health right. dollars that the federal government gives you, and then the government of Alberta keeps on telling you that Ottawa hates you. It's not Ottawa that hates you, Albertans. They have the money. Mm -hmm. They've just decided you're not worth it. It's as simple as that. They decided they had other priorities to spend the money on than keeping you healthy and alive. Keeping you healthy and alive. And then they'll stand in front of a mic and a camera when there's a natural disaster or something else happening ongoing. The number one job of a government is to keep its people safe. If that were true, you'd be spending the money on health. Because keeping people healthy and alive is keeping them safe. Yes. Is it not? Maybe. Once again, kids and cubs, our premiers are the problem. There's a reason why they're drumming. Trudeau's bad. Well, Trudeau's bad. Trudeau's bad. Trudeau's bad. Trudeau's. They want you to look there because they don't want you to look at them. Well, and, and here, this is here. Like this clip we've shown this before. I'll show it again. I think somebody should ask the provinces before they come back for more is what did they do with the money they were given the last time around? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what happened. The, the, since 2000, uh, federal transfers for health care have more than quadrupled. Uh, provincial spending on health care has only tripled, only tripled. Uh, if the provinces were spending all the money that they got from the feds, they'd be spending about $70, $70 billion more than they are. So what did they do with that $70 billion? They did it, well, put it to other purposes. One right? 
and those other purposes were not you. And that's Andrew Coyne, right? That's Andrew Coyne. Yeah, he certainly has no love for the federal government. So he is raining anger down on provincial premiers because they aren't spending the health care dollars on health care. Andrew Coyne, no fan of Justin Trudeau's or the federal government or liberal politics for that matter, yeah. calling out a truth, calling out conservative premiers for not spending the money where it's supposed to be spent. $70 billion. $70 billion. Remember the difference between a million seconds and a billion seconds? Right. Eight days versus 32 years. Right. Now, speaking of health, if you're in Ontario, um, something interesting may be happening. Former federal health minister Jane Philpott, mm -hmm. who was, uh, was or is working at Queen's University right now, uh, but I believe her term ends this coming June, is set to speak at next month's Ontario Liberal Convention and says she's concerning, considering a return to elected politics. Now, Jane Philpott, when she left federal government, was, I was very disappointed because she seemed to be one of the best health ministers that we had had in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if she's considering potentially becoming, running for the Liberal Party in Ontario, for which she would probably be touted as the future health minister of Ontario, uh, considering the quality of health minister we've had under Ford and currently have right now, because we only have a health minister, allegedly. Um, that could change things. That could change things. If the liberals, well, if the if, uh, progressive conservatives wanted to run away from discussing health uh, during the next election campaign, uh, having Jane Philpott running for you would make that very difficult for the progressive conservatives to do. Quote, I have been asked to speak about improving health care in the province. I think it's perhaps known that my specific interest is around primary care and how we can make sure that everyone has access to a family doctor or a primary care provider. So that will probably be the focus of my speech, she said, adding, quote, she's keeping all doors open. Phil Pott said the invite came after publication of her latest book called Health for All a few months ago. She was approached by a liberal conference organizer who asked her to speak on the topic of improving health care in the province. Her appearance at the convention is raising speculation that she might run for the provincial liberals in the next election. Philpott won election as liberal MP in 2015 and was appointed to Prime Minister Justin's first cabinet as health minister shortly after that vote. <clears throat> she sought re-election as an independent in 2019 in her greater Toronto area riding, but was defeated. Since 2020, Philpott has served as dean of Queen's University Faculty of Health Sciences. As an Ontario, an Ontario liberal source who asked to remain anonymous, uh, to speak freely, confirmed that Philpott is being eyed as a potential candidate for the party, as well as other names in the speakers list for the September convention in London, such as Vince Gasparo. I believe that Philpott is a strong name. She defeated Paul Calandra in the Markham Stofield writing in 2015. Uh, Paul Calandra has also made the move to provincial politics, and uh, he's the guy that uh, took over, I think it was the housing file. And uh, Paul Calandra's federal career was to be kind, less than stellar. Let's just put it that way. Um, he became famous for being uh, well, for not, not, not a great person. All the wrong reasons. Uh, yes, yeah. let's just put it that way. And well known in her time for Queen Park for not being particularly partisan, I think it's exactly the type of candidate the liberals need. Philpott said she'll remain at Queen's until her term expires in June, but won't seek an extension, but hasn't ruled out a return to politics. Quote, I'm committed to being there until next June. After that, I'm not sure. I really want to try to get a role where I can be involved in fixing health care, so politics is certainly one of the options I'm thinking about. I would stay tuned. Mm. Well, sticking with Ontario, mm. here's something. Ontario politics. I'm going to share this with you on the screen. As Ontario's new min Minister of Education does her back-to-school photo op in a school library, don't forget that the Ford government eliminated protected funding for school libraries and library staff earlier this year. They also cut funding for public libraries in half in 2019. Working for you, 
don't piss on me and tell me it's raining. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, uh, before we move to the next subject, uh, Mr. Grizzly, we have uh, another uh, back-to-school photo. This is uh, Jordan's mom mm-hmm. with Jordan. Yeah, I'm trying to bring it up here. Here we go. Aw. adorable. Oh, look at that. The higher the hair, the closer to God. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. I have a couple oh, more for you, too. That is, that is styling, though. Oh, yeah. That yeah. is styling, Jordan's mom. That's a, that's a, I like that. Back then, that was the thing. Oh, yeah. Well, here, I've Fashion. got more for you. This is uh, uh, Linda in, uh, what was it, school dress-up day in 1979. <laughs> a little Gene Simmons influence, I think. Love but it. Some vampiric, if you will. Love it. And then here is uh, this. Stewie this ha- one is uh, this next one you're going to like. This is no Jen. surprise. No surprise to me that we have the coolest kids. Come yeah. on, if you're doing that at that age, you're growing up to be in a cool. You're you're going to be a cool adult. This is our dear friend Jen Waddell on uh, graduation day. Is it graduation day? I think in 2000 with the Lego dress. Love it. And here is, I've got two more. Yes. Uh, let me just show you these. These are, this is Jazzy. Yay. On her Hi, first Jazzy. day. First day of uh, kindergarten, I believe it was. Oh. And uh, hang on a sec. Uh, and here is Rain. Just a wee, a wee Hi, cherub. Rain. Oh, because she's so adorable. Look at that. Ah, oh, I love it. 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 Okay. Um, what else do I have uh, for you kids? Oh, just uh, some uh, some kit comments that I, I really liked here for a second um, when we're talking about uh, education here. Uh, Mohan said, making teachers an enemy and wondering why nobody wants to teach. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. P- kit PNC bio, making teachers enemies is how you keep up the conservative base dumb enough to believe all their nonsense. Kid Vim, last winter we had four teachers on medical leave. Yeesh. Tabby G, teachers without credentials are filling in and Kit PNC Bio are teachers without credentials. Just people. So how can we send that? Kit Saucy, okay. it hasn't helped that colleges and universities can be inaccessible. We have many people who could be teachers, nurses, etc., but having the funds, childcare, and support for going back is hard to find. Uh, Kit Linda M, with a um, uh, potential solution. I wonder if a program to pay for teacher education in exchange for our commitment of assignment to an underserved school would work, like some places have done with doctors. Mm. It's it's worth a try. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's worth a try. I mean, uh, I, I read some stories recently in a, about communities in Ontario that are offering doctors signing bonuses to come over there, or and even actually like to, willing to provide them with an apartment or something, as if they'll stay for five years. Because they're covering uh, or paying off their 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 doctor's uh, student loans. Got one more for you. Oh my God! Is that Mademoiselle Fox? Yes, it is. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> that is so adorable. I know. I know. Oh my word! Oh, that is. Thank you, Kids and Cubs, for participating with that. We really appreciate that. We really appreciate that. Okay, um, politically, um, there's some stuff going on. Um, some um, parties are releasing some ads, uh, and uh, we're going to show them for you because yesterday we talked about Pierre Polyev's ad, um, but uh, we didn't bother with the audio on that one because, well, it's Pierre. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The BC NDP, uh, which is going into an election soon, uh, has released an ad. Actually, a lot of these ads uh, today that I'm going to be showing you are going to be NDP ads, provincial and federal. So mm-hmm. uh, this is the BC NDP with Premier uh, David Eby. Um, Labor Day themed, of course. But We're taking action in BC to help you, not people at the top. With David Eby, we're building more homes for the middle class, a lot more. Hiring more doctors, nurses, and teachers to help families, building more hospitals and schools than ever before, attracting more good jobs here and helping you with costs. We're taking action for BC families and we can't stop until the job's done. 
A message from David E. B. and the BCNDP. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Doesn't particularly stand out in any real way. Um, but uh, there you go. Uh, now, the um, federal NDP uh, actually put out uh, an ad as well that I have for you. And um, Jagmeet Singh had an interesting tweet uh, the other day, which is a, which was a good tweet in a certain way because it was attacking um, the conservatives <clears throat> with regard to labor. So, um, he, so he posted this with, "How do you this ad here?" He posted it with, "How do you tell when someone is your real friend?" It's who stands up for you when the chips are down and you're in a fight. In 20 years as a career politician, Pierre Polyev has never stood on a picket line. He takes money from CEOs and turns his back on workers, which uh, made me respond as well. A real friend also doesn't enter into a supply and confidence agreement with you, then proceed to sucker punch you in the kidneys each time you turn your back. <laughs> well, yes. Um, yes. So if uh, Jagmeet Singh can make, maintain this focus, he actually has a lane to be yes. relevant. Stop Stop pulling from the bottom of the conservative playing card deck. Pierre Paglia will never show up and support a picket line because he doesn't support unions. He doesn't actually support workers when they need it the most. Oh, you know, Pierre talks a good game and he talks that he wants to be for workers and he claims that he's one of us. I've never seen Pierre on a picket line because workers know who's true to them. I don't think Pierre can go to a picket line because I think he knows he won't be welcome at a picket line because Pierre's never been a worker and he's never stood with workers. And when someone shows you who they are, we need to believe them the first time. How do you tell when someone's your real friend? I say you can tell when someone's your real friend when you're in a fight. When you're in a fight, when your chips are down, when you're struggling, when you're hurting, who stands up for you then? When workers are on a picket line and they are struggling to get a fair collective agreement, which they have the right to do in this country, he doesn't show up, but you know who does show up? Jagmeet Singh. He shows up, walks the line, and walks... Oops, sorry. I cut that early. I didn't mean to. My apologies. That was a mistake on my part. I'll show it and I'll bring it back up. I, I hit the wrong button there. My apologies. Here we go. Let's continue on from where it was. He shows up, walks the line, and walks the top. And, you know, and he lives and breathes our values, and that's why we will continue to support him. I thought that was actually a pretty good uh, music choice, although I would have lowered the volume on it a bit yeah. in, yeah. in post-production. It was a little bit too high. Yeah. But yeah, I thought that, I liked the music behind it. It was good. It was good. Yeah. Now, uh, the NDP has also been busy on TikTok, um, mm -hmm. seriously, which uh, would be... If you show this, this is from Callum. <laughs> this is good. We'll show this. This is from Callum. How many? How many? Combien? How many? Combien? How many? Combien? How many? Combien? How many? You don't want to answer either. Can I respond? Yeah, it, it, oh, yeah, it's not the job of the reporter to answer questions. Yeah. So that it's was your from job the, the politician to answer them. Yes, that was from the NDP TikTok page. Uh, and it says, basically, for those listening at home, negotiating with your three-year-old, they have five minutes left at the playground. How much time? How much time? Yeah. How much time? Another two minutes? How much time? <laughs> um, so, yeah. And then the last one, and uh, I, when I say the last one, I am saving the best for last. This mm -hmm. is probably the best political ad I have seen in Canada since the 2015 election when they had the one, sorry, <clears throat> with a, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> yeah, right there. Don't die on us now. Gee, I choked on air. Jeez. That, I guess that can happen. <laughs> oh, God. Um, <laughs> that's so weird. Um, yes, uh, when uh, Justin Trudeau was walking in the park with the sleeves rolled up, saying what other people said about him, which was something you almost never do in an ad is give voice to the negative things that people are saying about you. And this is, they don't think I'm ready. Let's see. Right. 
That one was memorable. Uh, this, this is, is the Carol. best political ad. Yes. From Carol. How much is your pension? How much? How much? How much? How much? Oh, and speaking of Pierre's pension, when Pierre qualified for his pension at 31, he qualified under the old rules so he can start cashing it in at 55. So while he's calling Jagmeet Singh a sellout, when Jagmeet Singh finally qualifies for his, he'll only be able to start cashing it out at 65. Yeah. So, yeah, just saying. Uh, and I'm not sure how old Pierre uh, he's he in his 40s. He's yeah, he's in his, early his 40s. 40s. I think he's so, 42. Uh, He's 45, so he can actually start collecting. Baseball his taught me practice. Sorry. He can actually start collecting his pension in 10 years. Yeah. But the other guy's a sellout. Baseball taught me practice is important. You know what else matters? Results. Right now, Saskatchewan is in last place in education and in healthcare. When a batter loses their edge, they need to step away from the plate. Same with politicians. Saskatchewan deserves better. I'm Carla Beck, your Saskatchewan NDP official opposition leader. Wow. The best political ad I've seen in Canada in ages. Pardon the pun, but knocked it out of the park. Right? (laughs) <laughs> literally knocked it out of the park. Almost no reference to Scott Moe other than mm-hmm. when a batter loses their edge, they should step away from the plate. <clears throat> I detect shade, 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 everyone. Well, but that, it's basically I, I like her at a did, batting though. cage with a batting machine throwing balls at her and she's just hidden ball Pitching after machine. ball yeah. after ball after ball. What I like about it is she does not mention the opposing party or the party in power. She yep. talks about what she's going to do, what, you know, that's stay on message. I already know what the other guy's done. You don't need to tell me. I already know. Now in the next federal election, we do need the liberal party to step up and tell us what they've done for Canadians because most Canadians think all they've done is raise taxes, which they lowered, cost us trillions, which they saved our asses during the pandemic. And let people understand this. They brought in child care. They brought in dental care. They brought in pharma care. They brought in a school lunch program for children. Not enough people know this and they need to know it. Now, I'm, I'm, as I've said a million times before, I'll say it a million times more. I do not belong to any political party. I never will. But the Liberal Party needs to get their calm strategy together. I know the election's a year away. But they need to start messaging now because Pierre Polyev has been campaigning for two years. Two years. And all he does is lie every damn day. We had a two-minute video of him the other day and he lied nine times, eight times, nine times in a two-minute video? Mm -hmm. In two minutes? Mm -hmm. And everything's staged? Everything is staged. Now, speaking of things that may or may not have been staged... Algoma guy. Oh Algoma yes. yes. Guy. So the so the, the, the conspiracy theories still abound, but I, I I don't believe he was a plant. I believe he was just an ill informed individual. It's looking more and more so. Like I said, I would have got before I went to bed two nights ago, I would have absolutely gone died on the hill that this is James Oakley. Mm-hmm. I didn't until believe I it was saw, to be until, until I saw the group photo and saw that they both had the same lanyards on their past. Yeah. That would be hard to do. I mean, I mm-hmm. guess technically somebody mm-hmm. from the Prouds could have found mm-hmm. oh, someone yeah, yeah. from there who would be willing to lend their pass for the day so that someone could have it around and you know, and flip it. But then you got to make sure that it's like stuck face photo side down against your chest because if it ever flips at one point, it could slip and all that type of stuff. So if they have the same lanyard, it probably isn't James Oakley. So it's not, it, um, I, I, I really do not believe it to be yes. him. I didn't believe it to be him in the beginning. I know it's not Jeff Bollingall. No, it's not Jeff it's Bollingall not at all. Yes. I think it's just an ill-informed individual who has heard the poison and lies that Pierre Polyev has been spewing for the last two years and has begun to believe them. Repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. That is what has happened to this individual. Indeed. Indeed. And as we mentioned on the show, um, 
there are a um, there's an active group of people who are proactively preying upon men under 50, the frustrations, mm -hmm. yes. the way that life is changing for men under 50, particularly white men under 50. And yeah, they're losing their position of power. Yes, but they are literally basically pumping political fentanyl directly into their brains mm -hmm. via social media. Right? So this is, it's, it's not a surprise that it is showing up. Now, here's the thing, however, when we're talking about all of this here, because something happened yesterday that I noticed uh, when people were discussing this online. Now, remember... Uh, I need it's almost like a little harp. Pepperidge Bot Farms remembers. I think Mr. Grizzly maybe has that. Um, yes, I do. The Eager Beaver presents Pepperidge Bot Farms remembers. Remember when about 14,000 people allegedly went to Kirkland Lake and all were buzzing? for people and just couldn't stand themselves because all that energy and excitement they were going home with back home to Indonesia and France and California and New Mexico and Hawaii. Russia. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, go online and talk critically about Algoma Plant Guy claiming he can't make ends meet while he's allegedly raking in way over $5,000 a month clear. <laughs> and uh, get this, plus bonuses. Put a pin in that one. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, Pepperidge Bot Farms starts making a case for something. And now, Mr. Grizzly, I'm going to show you some tweets and tell me if you notice something that's common between these all, all these tweets. Okay. Okay, replying to a bunch of people. Alberta Che. Yep. He's a blue check. I have four kids. We'd struggle if we all brought home was five if we'd struggle if all we brought home was five thousand a month. They're all raising four young kids, or is it just your friends who waste their money on drugs, gambling, and mistresses? <laughs> or raising four kids. Mortgage, groceries, four kids, insurance, gas. 5000 is nothing, you fucking shill. Eric, do you have four kids? Jack Daniels. Douglas, do you have four kids? 5K per month is nothing. Might want to get yourself checked. David, I know a lot of families that live on a single income of around 50K with four kids. It's not easy, that's for sure. Now, not nah, one person, yes. They are a degenerate spender for sure. Steve. Or have four kids. Gator golf. I make well over that with four kids and a wife, and I can't confirm that it's nearly impossible to stay afloat. Have we noticed something? Yeah. You know, you I know? remember years ago, many years ago, uh, a person I was having a conversation with about budgeting and finances and this and that and the other thing, and, and she was telling me how one of her coworkers would complain about how she's always broke. But she had the super exclusive VIP cable package at two hundred and fifty dollars a month. I need that. No, I have to have that. I I need to watch my shows. No, you don't. No, you don't. So you're the so, mark. Yeah, the one about money, the spending, wasting money on drugs and booze and mistresses and whatnot was right. When we said some people make some interesting choices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. if you're having trouble making ends meet, but you have a mistress and you're spending money on them, rather than on your family, mm -hmm. maybe that contributes to you not being able to make ends meet. If you have a habit that you don't want people to know about, that may contribute to the fact. These are things that can happen. They are not universal rules. They don't apply to everyone. There are legit people that are struggling. But it is a reality that people don't make the wisest spending choices. 
Mm -hmm. Not everybody does. So all of a sudden, so many people suddenly concerned about families with four kids. Not three, not two, always four. Hmm. How many families have four kids? It's a good question. I'm glad ask you that. asked, Mr. Grizzly, because <laughs> I, I, I looked that up. You, you, you check the stats. There are just so many families with four children that this is the norm, except that when you check with uh, Statistics Canada. Um, <clears throat> oops. Mr. Well, don't forget, Michelle Ferrari would... has six. She's the single mother of six, according to her, right? <laughs> yes. Who, who, who lives with someone, but yeah. yes. Um, Mr. Grizzly? Canada's total fertility, fertility rate reaches a new low in 2022. After a slight rebound in Canada's total fertility rate between 2020, 1.41, and 2021, 1.44, the total fertility rate reached a new record low of 1.33 children per woman in 2022. So in the first two years of COVID, people got it on a little more. Mm -hmm. They were at home. Yes, but not that much. No. Mm -hmm. So families of four kids when the average fertility rate or the fertility rate is 1.33 women a ch child per woman uh, little graphic here Mr. Grizzly that shows uh, our fer total fertility rate with historic events so here you see a drop during the Great Depression Second World mm -hmm. War whoops starts going up 1960 authorization to sell contraceptive pills to regulate the hormonal cycle once that happened Drop. Wow. Precipitous. Yes. So uh, the fertility rate then was close to four mm -hmm. before contraception yes. was approved. Around then, and it's the only time in Canadian history <laughs> that it came close to four. 1969, decriminalization of contraception and abortion. Whoa. -ho. Yeah. This line here is population replenishment. So we drop below that. We have been below that since about 1971. Yes, without immigration, this country would die. Yes. And 2020 started with the COVID pandemic. Whoa, boy, did that drop. Just a little peak there, but then it, it dropped. Yes, Ms. Shadika, I have four kids, Jasmine, Rain, Mateo, and Mullen. So if there's somebody that could actually speak to that, how hard it is to make ends meet on a salary or two salaries with four kids, Miss and Mohan husband, would though, be able to do that. Remember. <laughs> Well, that's not a child. Mohan's her husband, her partner. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> oh, four kids. You, 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 you got me. That was you, a, I, I missed it. You missed I missed the sarcasm. It completely. I'm so sorry. Right over your head, man. Yes. <laughs> now, Mr. Grizzly. The average number of people per family in Canada was 2.9 in 2021. The average family size dropped from 3 to 2.9 after 2003 and has remained stable since. Now, that's the average number of people per family, so that would include parents, wouldn't it? Right. Yes. So in a two-parent family, that's one kid. In a one-parent family, that's two kids. So mm -hmm. the average number of the, the average family size is 2.9. But mm -hmm. everybody seems to be, everybody seems to have a family four. with four kids. Yeah. A, a family of at least five or six people. All of a sudden, and they're the only people answering. What if you had four kids? What if you had four kids? So, but here's the thing. What if you had four kids? Mm -hmm. I went because somebody pointed this out while everybody's talking about, uh, uh, I've got kids and I can't make ends meet on my salary. But if you live in Canada, um, you have a Canada child benefit. Yes. Don't you? So, um, and that entitles you to uh, get, uh, a maximum annual benefit per child under the age of six of $7,787 or $648.91 per month. The Canada Child Benefit, which, as you say, lifted over 60, 650,000 children without it, uh, out of poverty. Also, the $10 day child care spaces. Also, the Canadian Dental Plan. Your kids are going to be covered. Mm -hmm. um, right? So these are all programs that help. But if we're talking about the CCB here, so... Again, maximum annual benefit per child under the age of six, $7,787 per year as of July 2024, or $648.91 per month. And the maximum annual benefit for children aged 6 to 17 is $6,570, or $5,470.50 per month. 
So um, if now the CCB is means tested, so if you were in the, the bracket that would allow you to get the maximum, of course, you wouldn't be bringing in $130,000 to your, to your right. home annually. But the CCB website has a little calculator that you can get an idea of how many benefits that you would get. So I went there, and then I tested a case, a two-parent, single-income family. So two parents, but one income, four kids, each between six and 17, earning $130,000 a year, paying $3,500 a month rent and mortgage, qualifies for an additional $970.68 per month, non-taxable. Mm -hmm. That's at bringing in 130000 So if you're bringing right. in 60 or 70, it's going to be way more. Yes. Well, it, as I understand it, between the Child Canada benefit and the $10 day-day -day care, the average Canadian family saves something like $20,000 a year. That's a lot of money yeah. that you're not having to spend on those two things. Mm -hmm. So now, as I said, that's not counting the National Child Care Program, public education is covered by our tax dollars, National Dent Care, Dental Care, and impending National School Food Program. Well, yeah, but that starts today. But it's because government thought the bots mm -hmm. allegedly can't make ends meet. Yes. Color me unconvinced mm -hmm. that government is the source of your problem here. Now, about um, Algoma guy, specifically uh, our friend Kit Connie, who's been yes. on the show a couple of times, um, knows a little bit about finance. And uh, she decided to um, check out the um, Steelworkers dental plan. And uh, Mr. Grizzly, you might be very interested to uh, notice something here. Um, about that alleged $50 co-payment per person per visit on which he's allegedly behind? Mm -hmm. Well, here at the dental plan actions, they have five different options. Yes. Right? Diagnostic services, preventive services, basic restorative. Some of them cover 80%. Some of them cover 100%. So if you're willing to pay more for your plan, you get 100% coverage in certain mm -hmm. things. And some... 80. Now, if you go to the second page of that, prosthetics, crown inlay, online restorations, orthodontics, annual maximum, yes, but the annual, annual deductible. deductible that he's three years behind on that he claims was $50 per person per visit, per visit. in his family. If you take the cheapest plan, uh, what is it? Uh, $50 per individual, $100 per family. And it is? Annual. Not per visit. Yeah. Annually, you pay it once. A hundred dollars for a family. Guy the next cheapest plan is lying. twenty-five per individual, or fifty dollars per family. And the next plans after that, nothing, no deductible. Yeah. <sighs> Telling tales. Out so of here's the thing, right? It's like I can believe that he's so uninformed, and I can believe that he's a plant because he's that uninformed. Yeah. It's like, you really believe that you've been paying $50 per person per visit? Or is that just something you're telling your wife because you're um, doing something else with your money? Well, you know, here's the thing. Maybe he's gambling. Gambling's another one. Right. Gambling's Funded another one of those government. secret habits. Yeah. I mean, we've all heard stories. Well, like just this one. Uh, I can win the jackpot and this will get me free and clear. Like this, or of the surviving parent. Mm -hmm. Like this, when someone dies and then all of a sudden, you know, one person handled all, handled all the money all the time. You don't need to worry mm -hmm. about that. And then the person dies and says, wait a minute, I thought we had savings. And that's when they find out. We all have heard the stories. Mm -hmm. it, oh, it happens. happens. Yeah. Again, it's not the general rule. No, no. But it happens. It happens. So... I'm just sitting there and going like, how could you be so unaware of your own dental plan to be, I can say, you know, like we pay $200 d d d deductible annually and it was really 175 Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's yeah. a mistake. Yeah, but I pay $50 one. per person per visit when it's... $50. Annually? 100 for family. 100 for family? family? Yeah. 
That mistake is so big, mm -hmm. so big that again, it's like maybe it's both. Maybe he works there and is a plant. It's not beyond the realm of possibility to have somebody who's extremely conservative minded and hyper partisan working at Algoma Steel. I mean, we had people in the RCMP that made donations to the convoy. Yeah, well, yeah, it's true. It's true. It's not out the, the realm of the but we would like to believe that that's not, but it could be somebody who's there and, but also is very politically active and an activist and saw an opportunity. That's the thing about having a network of people. Yes. So yeah, <clears throat> exactly. Get saucy. You could still work at the plant and be a plant. It doesn't take much to encourage an instigator. So, uh, but yeah, so that's why I'm saying I, I keep on, may not be James Oakley. Mm -hmm. Still doesn't mean he's not working for Jeff Bollingall in some well, way. Well, who knows? Who knows? But either way. Uh, yeah. But I've got one more thing to before be we that wrap wrong, up here, sir. To be that wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah. One more thing before we wrap up here. I'm going to share this on the screen. Uh, this is from our friend, Senator Patrick Brazil. Oh, yes. And this is interesting what he has to say. One day, we'll take alcohol more seriously. Not one NHL team that sent right. condolences for Johnny Goudreau mentioned this was alcohol-related. Right. It was a drunk driver that killed Johnny Goudreau and his brother. Yep. Alcohol companies are huge sponsors of sports teams, but don't want to mention it was alcohol-related. It hurts their sales. Tragic ending. He's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Now, this one I like here because this is this is good. Here's my first bill on alcohol, uh, S254 in Canada. This fall, I will be introducing a second bill to ban alcohol advertising in Canada writ large. In the very near future, I will introduce a, th introduce a third piece of legisl legislation dealing with alcohol. Seven fatal cancers that we know of, matter of fact, along with all of the things we tend to turn a blind eye to, the deaths, DUIs, accidents, injuries, lost productivity, suicides, domestic violence, addictions, and an al alcohol deficit in Canada of $6 billion. So this is what he's going to, uh, this, these, this is part of the bill, the promotion, and I think this is pretty good, this one. It's a package of cigarettes with beer bottles in it. Big mm. tobacco didn't want you to know either. Enable the label. It's a mm. fact. Alcohol consumption is linked to seven fatal cancers. Sen Senator Patrick Brazo's bill S254 would require cancer warnings, warnings on alcoholic beverages. Why do we need bill S254? Many Canadians don't know that there's a direct causal, uh, casual link between alcohol consumption and seven fatal cancers. Cancers caused by alcohol, oral cavity. Off. I can't, I can't pronounce that. Ophiolarynx, orophorynx, larynx, esophagus, breast in women, liver, colorectal. So yeah, this is a fair warning, fair labeling. I, I, I support this bill. Yep. Um, and some people go, wow, he's just trying. He's, and he's been blunt. He's not trying to ban the sale of alcohol. He's not trying to prevent you from purchasing alcohol. He's saying, if you're going to make the purchase, make an informed one. I can get behind that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did it with tobacco. Why mm -hmm. can't they do it with alcohol? Indeed. Indeed. Well, and, and the thing that he pointed out to us during the mental health walk chat, I was drinking Corona Sunbrew, which I do like. I find it's a very, it tastes just like a Corona. Okay. Non-alcoholic beer. Says right on the bottle, do not consume more than two bottles a day. Right on the bottle for a non-alcoholic beer. Mm-hmm. But the one with alcohol in it doesn't say anything of that nature. So right. that is a problem. Indeed. That's the problem. Indeed, I agree with you. A um, little Paralympic news before we go away, because uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we're getting about two medals a day. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday we broke that trend. We got three. Mm -hmm. And gold medal this morning. finally a first gold. Mm -hmm. Apparently there's another yesterday. gold. Yes, there's another gold this morning. So mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, the golds are starting to come in now. Uh, but Canada is now at 12 uh, Olympic, uh, Paralympic gold medals. Uh, but the first one uh, was by this guy right here, uh, Mr. Grizzly. So yeah, I saw let's that. show his photo. 
So there you go. Look at that gold. Look at that smile. I saw the swim, and then when they played the national anthem, he was weeping tears of joy. Ah, love it, love it. So uh, this is Nicholas Bennett, who won the gold medal in the men's 100-meter breaststroke, SB, swimming, breaststroke, 14 mm -hmm. class. So uh, has more ability uh, than, uh, than uh, other athletes because the higher the number, the greater the ability, the lower number, the, the lesser the ability, or the more impaired the ability. Mm -hmm. um, so um, rather than lesser, more impaired, I would say. Uh, is probably the better word here in this case. Uh, but he won it, and he becomes the second multiple medalist for Canada because he had one um, of silver, I think, the day before in, uh, in another event. Um, so he joins Aurélie Rivard as being uh, the second multiple medalist, the first male. But uh, this gold medal also happens to be the 400th Paralympic medal for Canada in the history of the Games. Boom. So uh, that brings us to one gold, four silver, six bronze for a total of 11. And uh, this morning, there has been another gold medal on the track. But I will not talk more about it because I don't want to spoil it for everyone in case because the broadcast does, doesn't start until uh, later today. So I uh, won't, uh, won't spoil who it is, what event, what it is, so that uh, you can still have the element of surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we are now at 12 medals, two gold, four silver, uh, six bronze. So there you go. That, that, that's, we're doing well uh, here. Um, and it's uh, interesting to note that uh, over the past uh, few Paralympics, Canada's medal hall has uh, decreased over time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had over 30 medals uh, in London, and then it, you know, it's been increasingly going down. And it's not because our para-athletes are less skilled. It's because more nations are joining and are competing. The Paralympic movement is growing, so there's yes, more yes, competition. Yes. And have you noticed, because I've been watching quite a, quite a few events, I watched uh, wheelchair rugby last night. Mm -hmm. Japan won, they beat the Americans, and we were both thrilled to watch Japan win. Have you noticed that the crowd sizes are what we would call oh, uh, massive? Yes. Like massive. The French like, have Way totally to go, France. It. Way to go, Paris. Selling out damn near everything. Well done. The French have really, really Stepped bought up. in. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no, th this is good. This yeah. Is good stuff. Um, our basketball teams, by the way, have uh, both made uh, the bracket rounds. Okay. And so is our uh, women's uh, sitting volleyball team. People were wondering about the men's basketball team because they kept on saying, you know, don't don't expect anything this year. Um, but um, they're into the bracket rounds, and once you're into the bracket rounds, anything can happen. Mm-hmm. Murder ball. Yes, it is murder ball. Wheelchair yes, wheelchair be known as murder ball. But I will say in the Olympics, I think they've – backed off a little bit with the murdery aspect. <laughs> I've, I've seen other games where it's like, somebody's going to die. Uh, but in the Olympics, I think they ease back just a little bit, probably for the, you know, the, 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 the optics that's an international stage, millions of people are watching. So, but it, I mean, they were, they were still thrilling matches, but I do, I do think, and, and Kyle, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I watched a lot of the matches and I do think they've backed off a little bit on the murder ball aspect. Because I haven't seen a whole lot of people flipping over or bleeding. So I Every don't time, think they want that in the Olympics. See, if I was a um, global despot, there mm -hmm. would be a law that anytime somebody talked about murder, mur murder ball, there'd be the soundtrack from the music from the shower scene from Psycho going on. Yeah. Time for murder ball. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I didn't know we had that one. Oh, I've got lots of them. Okay, try to hold on. I was like, gee, Doug Ford, I wonder what it is that made you not properly fund health care. Could it be, oh, Satan? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is brilliant. I love that sound. Okay. okay. Mr. Let's Grizzly, wrap do we have We're a well past two hours here, <laughs> and I'm going to take Miss Lola out before she soils my uh, house.
Kids and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Paper Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we loved making this for you. Thank you for being right on point with that one. It was perfectly timed. It worked well. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> um, sharing is caring. Word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Please do. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you who have uh, joined us uh, recently. Again, we are starting to see uh, the change in our, our viewership of most of our shows now are, are, are crossing 200, uh, which is uh, new for us. So, well, you know, last year this time, if we were hitting 200 uh, views on a show on our YouTube page, that was like, um, was like, oh my God, something extraordinary happened. Now it's almost becoming common over the past few weeks. So thank you. We really appreciate it. The more ears, the better, because we do want the word to get out. So we appreciate everything that you do. If you'd like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl, who has sponsored us yet again, yet again this year. So if you uh, scan that QR code that just appeared, that brings you to our pod page. Now, if you're new here, do not go to pod cage. No, you cannot be responsible for what you out. see. Well, it's not there. I checked it out. Doesn't okay. It <laughs> just saying. But pod page. Pa, pa, pa. <laughs> dot com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words and if you click on subscribe when you're there when we have something fresh off the bandwidth it comes directly to you now if you would like to support us in other ways then you need to make like kit elaine and surf on down to the true north eager beaver media youtube page like over eleven thousand of you have so far and uh lick our buttons like, share, subscribe, click them, flick them, lick them. It makes us very happy when you do that. And we like to be happy. And we know that you love for us to be happy. So we know that you will go. Thank you very much. And if you would like to help us in other ways, well, then you need to go to our coffee page. That's coffee. No? Mr. Wizard? I'm sorry. You were shaking your head no. No, no, I'm, I'm looking oh. at the screen here. So. Okay, sorry. I thought that was for me. I, saw, I thought no. I was doing something that wasn't okay. Oh, thank you, whoever scanned the QR code. Go to our coffee page. That's ko-fi.com slash uh, eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there you will find our tip jar, or keep Mr. Grizzly employed jar. <laughs> keep him fed. Keep him fed. Feed the bear. <laughs> the feed the bear fun. Feed the bear. Please feed the bear. <laughs> yes, at the Beaver Lodge, it's okay to feed the bears. Um, so please do. Uh, anything that you can contribute, of course, is uh, makes us very happy and is very appreciated. Earns our eternal gratitude and also boosts our sex appeal by 37.2%. The point two is very important. We like we made sure that we had the most precise calibrated devices to come up with that number here at uh, the Beaver Lodge Scientific Labs. But uh, if you uh, make a little contribution there, um, not only will uh, you not be weighed down by all those loonies and toonies that are in your pocket so that you can get places faster, but you also help us keep on producing the show that you love. So anything you can contribute is very helpful and appreciated, but if you cannot contribute, hey, that is not a problem whatsoever because the gift of your attention is the one that we appreciate the most and the gift of your participation and we love to hear from you so please write to us at true north eager beaver at gmail.com and if uh, you have some more pictures from uh, back to school please send them we'll show them that it's back to school week so we've got uh, we've got time all week to show your pictures so please 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 show them uh, we really appreciate that and uh, i see that mateo will be grade two student tomorrow as well and that rain is starting grade 10 tomorrow. So um, hope you both have a wonderful school year. All right? Lots of fun ahead of for both of you. And uh, lots of time with friends. But uh, make sure to learn some stuff along the way, okay? <laughs> uh, so yes, write to us. Uh, TrueNorthEagerBeaver at gmail.com is our email address at TrueEager on Twitter, TrueNorthEagerBeaver on Facebook, or you can leave some comments on our YouTube page. We do read everything and we appreciate everything that you do, especially when you send us story suggestions. 
Because democracy is something that you do, we're getting very close to those uh, federal by-elections in Elmwood, Transcona, and in La Salle Villemar Verdun. They will be happening on the 16th, so that's just 13 days from now. So make sure that you have planned your vote. Uh, make sure that you've received your voter um, identification card. If you've not received it, uh, there's still time to ask for it. If you do not have it, don't worry. There are alternative ways to prove your identity at the polling station. But make sure you make a plan uh, to go vote. And remember, bring someone with you. Mm-hmm. Bring someone with you. And I'm not sure if, uh, if right now we're in the uh, early voting period where you might be able to do that. I should look that up and bring you that information tomorrow. I don't know. <clears throat> but I will do. But if it is the early voting period, uh, vote early. That could be part of your voting plan as well. Or vote by mail. That could be part of it as well. Uh, there are many options for you. All right. That's because democracy is something that you do. Mr. Grizzly, I believe that's time for your wisdom, words of wisdom. Well, as I said earlier. Or second time. Second time, yeah. I started off the show with it, and, and I want to end with it as well. If you are heading back to school, whether it's university or college or high school or whatever the case may be, and I know we don't have a lot of, of uh, viewers 18 and under, almost none, and that, that's okay. That's fine. But if the message, if I can get this message out to you, remember, today is the first day of school. And remember, if today is a bad day, and this is a difficult year, it's not always going to be like this. This is temporary. This is mere blip in your lifetime. Trust me, you will look back 10, 15, 20 years from now and go, I can't believe I put so much emotional effort into that crap. At least that's how I look at it. Maybe you'll look at it differently. But either way, don't let people bring you down. You're going to be okay. Anything that happens bad to you while you're in school is temporary. It's all temporary. Same with the good stuff. That's only temporary too. So live the best life you can and make the most of each day. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, you had Kit PNC by asking, where do I send photos? True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com. Yeah, we'll put them up right. tomorrow. We'll put them up tomorrow. Okay, uh, Mr. Grizzly, I believe it would be time for you to cue that cog. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. Okay, uh, and Kit PC Bio, I've seen your your other thing. I use the web interface. Any clues? The other way uh, that you can do it is if you go to if you happen to be on uh, Twitter. Um, Go to a True North Eager Beaver, like us. Uh, we'll find you back. We'll like you. And then that will make, um, when you go on our profile, you'll see a little envelope appear. That means that we can DM each other, so you can just send it privately to us there, if email is not the, the option for you. All right? I have some sad news to share for the Easter egg. Um, oh, no. From Doug Saunders. Uh, heartbroken to lose Stevie Yes. Cameron. My friend and the journalist who launched my career when she took me in at 25 as a researcher on her book on the take, which unveiled one of Canada's major prime ministerial corruption scandals. Let me tell the story. Now, I'm not going to share the whole story here because it's quite long. But yeah, sad to lose Stevie Cameron. I have that book on the take. If you want to learn about what the Mulroney government did, who boy. And uh, talking about people that we lost, I uh, keep on forgetting to mention it, uh, but uh uh, a while ago now, I think it's about a week ago, uh, um, former uh, reform MP Chuck Strahl. Oh, I didn't know he passed away. Yeah, he did pass oh, away. Oh. So uh, to uh, all his uh, family, because I believe that his uh, son had uh, joined politics uh, as well uh, later on. 
but yes, uh, on August 14th, it was reported. So, so we're really late with this one, but uh, he died after battling mesothelioma. Oh, that's asbestos related lung cancer. Yeah. Mesothelioma is terrible. Yeah, indeed. So his uh, son uh, from, uh, who's the, who is the MP from Chilliwack, Hope, Mark Strahl, posted to social media, our loss is deep and profound. Our dad was our best friend, our greatest defender, our biggest promoter, and our rock. Uh, Strahl served as an MP for more than 17 years, winning six consecutive elections. He was first elected to the House of Commons in 1993 in the Fraser Valley East riding. Um, sometimes controversial, but often considered one of the people from the reform movement with whom you could actually have a conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I'm not, yeah. Uh, he worked as a logger and a businessman before uh, entering politics. Uh, he left uh, the Canadian Alliance. Um, sorry, he, yes, he wasn't elected. Yes, he entered the federal politics in 1993 with the Reform Party uh, and then uh, was reelected under the Canadian Alliance banner, which replaced the Reform Party. Um, in 2001, he left the Canadian Alliance, joining the Breakaway Democratic Representative Caucus that formed as a protest against the leadership of uh, Stockwell Day. Um, then uh, went on to be uh, elected a few more times after that. Uh, he announced in 2005, uh, when he was 48, that he had lung cancer. And uh, that July, he said that he had had a collapsed lung and he was hospitalized when it collapsed a second time. He left the House of Commons in 2011 uh, before going to chair the Security Intelligence Review Committee, which oversaw the Canadian Security Intelligence Service until he stepped down in 2014. Um, After his diagnosis, Strahl broke ranks with his party several times to speak out against Canadian exports of asbestos, a mineral that can cause mesothelioma after exposure. And uh, Pierre Polyev uh, said in a post, uh, said in a post to X, Chuck's unwavering commitment to our movement and his deep love for Canada were part of everything he did. He was a man of principle, integrity, and compassion, and a foundational member of our Conservative Party. And uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Pierre Polyev, if you believe that about him, then honor him by becoming someone like that, mm-hmm. rather than just talking about other people who are. Yeah. yeah. All right. Have a beautiful day, everyone. I'll see you.